All we've got to do now is to start pumping. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Fully Inflated Football Podcast Week 3 Recap episode here. A very full show ahead. Before we do get started, I want to let you guys know today's show is brought to you by Underdog. So we've got some not so great primetime matchups just around the corner here tomorrow night. Cowboys, Giants, okay. You know, next week, Tennessee, Dolphins, Monday Night Football. And I know I certainly will be playing Pick'em on Underdog Fantasy to help me get a little bit more interested in these games. In fact, I've got a lineup set already for tomorrow night's game. I've got CeeDee Lamb finding his way into the end zone. Dak Prescott having a good bounce back week after two losses higher than 261 passing yards. Jake Ferguson back into the lineup looking good last week. Flexed down to higher than three and a half receptions. Devin Singletary looking good. For the Giants, wearing Saquon Barkley's number higher than 49 and a half rushing yards. And Theo Johnson, a rookie out of Penn State that uh, I'm a good bit lower on, has been very quiet and getting faded out of the lineup recently. I've got him going lower than two and a half receptions. And this lineup pays out uh, six times your entry. Just a great example of how these can help you keep you glued to your seat. Even if this isn't a great game, you'll be sitting there to make sure Theo goes all the way through without getting that third reception. I love getting able to play these pick em slips on Underdog Fantasy. And right now, if you sign up using promo code TFG, they will give you a bonus match up to $1,000 and you will support this podcast and my channel in the process. But with that, we've got a very full slate of week three action to recap here today. And I want to start where the week ended up with the Commanders going into Cincinnati and not just winning 38 to 33 in a shocking upset, but the Jaden Daniels breakout primetime performance. My goodness, what a night for Jaden and Commanders fans. Two straight weeks without a punt. Again, they put up 38 points in a victory in this game. Genuinely one of the best quarterback performances you'll see this season. In fact, it was so good that I emotionally tweeted that it is one of the best quarterback performances you'll ever see. Probably a bit hyperbolic from me there. I didn't see that the stat line, you know, you know it, it felt like watching this game. He had 400 passing yards and was 35 of 38. It wasn't quite that much. It ended up being, what, 300 passing yards, 21 completions, something like that. But um, just a, a monster, monster night for the commanders and, and especially Jaden Daniels and, and commanders fans too. Like they have been through it. So just they're riding the absolute high of highs this week. And I've been saying it on Twitter on X that it, it already feels like I'm going to be wrong about my pre-draft take on Jaden Daniels. Um, you know, not necessarily that I hated him or wrote him off or anything like that. He was my QB three in this draft. Uh, I had a first round grade on him. I went back to what I said on him in the deep dive to see just how big of a hole did I dig myself on Jaden Daniels. You know, I did say like with development, he has a chance to be a great quarterback, which was an encouraging reminder to myself to be like, yeah, yeah I didn't go all the way in on hating him, but I did say that the commanders were going to regret not taking Drake May and that that really surprised me. And, you know, the commanders do not have any regrets about this pick, certainly right now, and it doesn't feel like they're really ever going to regret this pick. There's still a lot to learn about Drake May, and maybe in time it proves to be correct, but... They clearly were on to something about Jaden Daniels being the right pick for them. And it, really where, where it's, I feel the most wrong about Jaden Daniels is, is how good he's been quickly. I thought he was going to struggle in his rookie season. Really, it's not just how good and how quickly he's been good for Washington, but the other area where I feel like I was off on him is the areas of his game that he's been good and how he's been good so far in the NFL. My big weaknesses, my big knocks on Jaden Daniels coming out were at LSU. I, he didn't attack the middle of the field. He would survey his reads, but he would consistently 
have those op- open pass ups at LSU where there'd be a wide open dig or crosser right in front of him and he would just gloss right over it oftentimes take off and run or just throw it deep to Malik neighbors um that was another thing was the surrounding talent was just so good it was hard to give him all of the credit for what happened at LSU um but even when he did throw the middle of the field oftentimes he would throw it late um and the safety would come crashing down break up the pass I was afraid that those were going to turn into interceptions at the NFL level But here, really to start his career, and I think we saw flashes of this in the second half last week against the Giants, where I did give him praise for it, but all game against the Bengals, he was just a surgeon from the pocket, picking apart the middle of the field. It's like he's he's completely developed or would be a case of LSU just wasn't asking him to do those things yet he was actually capable of doing those things. I would more so argue that, as I've pointed out, like he has crazy work ethic and he's just figured this out rather quickly. Yes, in a different offense, um, because Cliff Kingsbury's offense is very predicated on those leveling concepts, attacking the middle of the field. And that was a worry for me with him coming into this offense. And it's, it's been a strength of his game. And that's a big reason why I'm... I know ready to come out after three weeks and be like, I was wrong because it's the, the specific weaknesses that I was worried about with Jaden have been maybe the best part of his game so far. And that's just so shocking and commendable and exciting for Jaden Daniels, because that raises the floor of all of this on top of that, by the way, he is not making mistakes. He's not putting the ball in harm's way. Not that that was something he did at LSU, but look at Bo Nix. He didn't do that at Oregon. And, You know, he's been putting the ball in harm's way in the NFL. Jaden Daniels is not doing that. So the floor is super high, but then you also have the obvious high-end plays from Jaden Daniels that we knew, regardless of really how good he was, were going to be there, right? The rushing, the, the deep ball ability, that was, you didn't, you know, you didn't have to blink twice to see that in his tape at LSU. And, and now that the floor seems pretty high with his processing, his decision-making, his pocket presence is very good. Um, You know, the floor is high and then you get these exciting plays on top of it. And now this week we saw the deep ball getting unlocked now that he's kind of settling in because week one, I I didn't have too many takeaways because they just threw a bunch of bubble screens. His average depth of target was like five yards. They were very clearly protecting him early Week two, they had the same game plan early, and then you started to see some of this in the second half against the Giants. And now week three, it's like, you know, full go. And you're seeing the deep ball getting unlocked here. Two touchdown passes to Terry McLaurin on just dimes down the field. And that was like the biggest strength of Jaden Daniels was how well he threw the deep ball. So it's just so, so exciting. Commanders fans, you have every reason to be taking victory laps on people like myself that were lower on Jaden Daniels. He just looks incredible. Looks like a a hit out the gate. A lot of time left, but it's going to take a pretty sharp U-turn with how good his film looks right now for him to at least not be a very good quarterback. The the one thing is like, dude, just please slide. Stop taking so many hits, please. Um, Because this is a very electric quarterback. I mean, honestly, if this is what Jaden Daniels is, and I know this is a big statement and it's one game, he's got to prove that this is who he is. Bengals defense didn't exactly um, put up a wall of resistance in this one. But if this this quarterback that we saw Monday night, if that is consistently who Jaden Daniels is, we are talking about an accurate Lamar Jackson. And that is extremely, extremely exciting. Um, so just what a night for the commanders and, and the team won, right? They're two and one. Their season is like interesting. I'm not just wrong about Jaden Daniels, but I had them uh, as, as my first team in the deep dive series, right? Like I thought they were going to stink, but as we know, when you get quarterback play like this, you're going to win some football games. Um, and they had some other players stepping up in light of this too, you know, Terry McLaurin, not a big surprise. The second he starts getting good, accurate deep ball targets, he's one of the best deep threats in the league. But it was so fun to see him have a big statement night 
he really is the perfect pairing with Jaden Daniels. Um, because I do think I do think McLaurin is one of the four best true deep threats in the league. The, the you know the Willie Mays over the shoulder catches, the ability to moss defenders, the speed to get open deep. He is a really special vertical threat that was on display. Really fun to see that. Um, and he could have even had even more. The one sort of like meh drop back from Jaden Daniels was he was trying to hit the deep cross to Terry McLaurin. He was wide open, broke the safety's ankles, like wide ass open. No one within 20 yards of him down the field. And Jaden Daniels uh, was a second read play. He's kind of getting hit while he throws it and couldn't quite get it out there. Um, uh, accurately, at least. I think he did actually end up overthrowing it, uh, kind of overcompensating for the hit. But, you know, not, not, not the end of the world for Jaden Daniels on a night like that when your worst play is uh, something like that. So, you know, the point is Terry McLaurin could have had even more in this game. And uh, yeah, that's, it's just great to see, man. He's one of these guys that has been through the ringer in terms of bad quarterback play. And then also like the offensive line looks really good. Uh, Sam Cosme gets that big contract extension, an absolute monster in this game. And then the running back duo, super underrated running back duo in Washington, the run game in general is working. And that's something we figured was going to be there because if Cliff gets credit for anything, uh, he, he did have a good run game with Kyler Murray and the threat of the quarterback's legs in that offense in Arizona. Uh, Jaden Daniels, very similar in that way. So we figured the run game would look pretty good, but what we didn't really figure, especially was that Austin Eckler was going to look this back and Brian Robinson is just an underrated running back. He is a stud. So they have a very good um, running back duo doing some work on the ground, too. So, you know, the commander's offense is fun, man. And, and I don't even really have much to say about their defense. They are going to be going through a developmental season on that side of the ball uh, as Dan Quinn tries to figure out who are going to be the building blocks moving forward for that unit. Uh, this year was all about Jaden and, and making sure the offense is working. And, um, it, 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 that is working, right? So that's good. But uh, this week, you've got Cardinals, Commanders. What a fun game just to watch with all the offense we're expecting here. You have the Cliff Kingsbury uh, versus Kyler Murray narrative. Very, very fun matchup. I even had them ranked back-to-back -back in my power rankings this week. So very much looking forward to that matchup. And uh, just congrats, Commanders fans. It's It's looking like... You're going to have fun watching football again for the foreseeable, if not long-term, future here. And then I also wanted to mention, I had some people tagging me on Luke McCaffrey doing some stuff in this game. That was another player in this commander's draft that I really was not high on. Thought they overdrafted him. He got involved. He had three receptions in this game. Some commander's fans are trying to take victory laps on me. So I went in and watched all three of his targets in this game. I mean... It's good to see him making himself useful, but look, I, if, if I catch myself being wrong on a draft take, I think I've shown I'm happy to admit that. But uh, I don't know, man. He got lost on a late in the play on a crossing route where Jaden Daniels found him late in between zones, and then he caught two underneath passes. Um, again, good to see him making himself useful, getting out there on the field. Still looks pretty slow to me. I'm definitely not ready to apologize for uh, not liking Luke McCaffrey. We'll see. We'll, we'll continue to monitor that. But I did want to bring that up because a lot of Commanders fans were tagging me on that one. But let's talk about the Bengals. Unfortunately, we got to talk about the Bengals. Like, bro, what, what the hell, Cincinnati? The defense. I thought, Lou, I thought higher of Luana Rumo to get this defense straight. The changes they made with the safeties. I thought they had the linebacking core, a slot corner like Mike Hilton, enough pieces on the D-line to at least have a serviceable, well-coached defense, right? Like, I'm not asking them to shut teams out. Just keep teams to 20, 24. In the case of this game, 28 points. Find a way to get a stop against a rookie quarterback. They couldn't do it, and they haven't been able to do it this year. This, this defense has looked putrid, with the exception of getting up for the Chiefs. Um, but 
And even in that game, it's not like their defense was shut down. They just played okay. And, and Trey Hendrickson played out of his mind in that game against a, a rookie tackle. But the D-line is doing nothing for them. They continue to miss a bunch of tackles. Look, they look slow. They're missing tackles. Um, the secondary is not playing well. And, and Luan Arumo is not doing anything schematically to, like, mix things up and, and elevate these guys either. So it's, it's just a disaster. And it's like, man, what a fall off for Lou where it, it went from two years ago when, when they had these great playoff runs, he felt like a potential head coach candidate, one of the best defensive coordinators in the league. And now it's like, I don't know, man, like he can game plan against the chiefs, but is he, is he going to be out in Cincinnati after this year? And, and, I know the offense played well, but I just, I don't know about Zach Taylor either, man. I just, I've never felt great about him. These slow starts, like, yes, the offense looked pretty good, but he's also responsible to get the team prepared. Like, they skipped the preseason. That's his decision. Um, this is, what, the third year in a row where they've come out and just put themselves behind the eight ball immediately. And do or die this week in Carolina, Andy Dalton a chance to end the Bengals season, what a storyline that would be. It's a major, major concern for Cincinnati. And, and what a disappointment for a team that I really had hopes for this year. Um, offense did their thing, though. That's good to see, at least. But let's go ahead and move forward to the other Monday night game. Um, I want to call out Jeff Schwartz, because I like Jeff Schwartz, former offensive lineman. He's an NFL analyst. Uh, great Twitter follow. but. Horrible take, Jeff, said, nobody wants two Monday night football games. The fuck we don't. Yes, we do. I love doubleheaders on Monday nights. What, what would you rather have 10 games on noon at Sunday that you can't pay attention to? Like two TVs, one game on each, um, one game at like the, the timing of it makes sense where the first game's hitting halftime just as the other game's kind of just getting started. It's perfect. So huge L, Jeff Schwartz. Uh, anyway, loved, loved Monday night. And this game was, was fun, too, at least for one team, <laughs> being the Buffalo Bills. Uh, but a lot to talk about in this one. Let's start with the winning team, the Buffalo Bills. Just what a tidal wave this offense feels like right now. They just feel unstoppable, and they've felt unstoppable all season long. Just a complete round of applause for the whole plan here, the execution of what they wanted this offense to look like, and for it to look this good out the gate is so impressive. I mean, think about all these teams going through learning curves, trying to figure themselves out. The Bills hit the ground running, fully prepared with a plan, and that's with some new pieces here, right? Getting rid of your number one wide receiver, and it has just been seamless. And I think. I think it, to some degree, McDermott deserves credit for it's hard. It's hard to know exactly like how involved he was in this sort of transition to this offensive style that we've talked about. It's a very, you know, the death by a thousand bruises offense. It's a very kind of nickel and dime approach just with a more blunt quarterback in Josh Allen. But you got to think McDermott at least signed off on this or had a vision for this to some degree that carries down, of course, to the offensive coordinator here, Joe Brady, who had one of the most impressive, like overnight higher transition moments for a coordinator last year, they fired Ken Dorsey. They promote Joe Brady. All of a sudden the offense was working that is carried over to this year. They do feel like they're going to be, you know, they're going to lose him. I don't think they're going to let McDermott go. They're going to be faced with that dilemma yet again. Uh, but a credit to Joe Brady. I mean, if you're going to run this kind of offense where you're keeping the defense guessing, you've got all these different kind of slot options, two tight ends, a QB run game, a lot of different pieces to kind of manage. You got to know when to push those buttons, how to spread it around, keep things balanced and keep the defense guessing. It is, it has just been seamless so far from a play calling perspective. The balance has been phenomenal. And then, of course, Josh Allen, he's just the, the lock MVP through three weeks. Like, forget about it. Like, there's no question. He is 
absolutely dialed in. Um, zero passing mistakes in three games. Th- that's been the beat on him, right? Like, ESPN is probably crying internally right now because they can't run segments about how Josh Allen threw a stupid interception last week. It's been the complete opposite. No quarterback is, has been more surgical, um, t- taken better care of the football, made the right reads more consistently than Josh Allen. And if he's reached this level, this sort of Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees-esque processing, ability to see the field. If he's anything close to that, which through three games he has been, it's over, man. It is over because this dude's physical tools, I was, I was reminded um, in the podcast last week, I said that I'm on the record saying Josh Allen is the most physically gifted quarterback in the history of the NFL. I did completely forget that we have Anthony Richardson now. Just full disclosure, that's what happened there. I still believe Anthony Richardson has more physical gifts in terms of size, speed, strength, arm strength, all that. Um, So we'll say second most physically gifted quarterback ever. Um, You you put the, the mental of this now with the physical of this and and we're seeing the results, right? I, I don't know the answer to stop what they have right now because they, they're hitting you from every different angle uh, through the air with the run game as well because they have the QB run game element. They have an explosive run game because James Cook can gas you, but because they're spreading you out so much, there's so much space for him to get these runs. And, and the offensive line has been a strength too. So it's just been wild how good the Bills look. I put them number one in my power rankings this reason, uh, this week for a reason. So just a a total round of applause for the Buffalo Bills offense. And their defense looked great in this game, too. Uh, I shied away from giving McDermott and this defense too much praise for the Dolphins game because, to me, that game felt a lot more like the Dolphins just shooting themselves in the foot. But not in this game. I mean, they went out and were just flying around, man. Like, just team defense was on full display in this game. Uh, The coverage on the back end. That is where McDermott has been. I think that's where you see the best of Sean McDermott is his ability to keep these secondaries playing at this level, even when they're losing pieces and have guys changing teams and rookies coming in, like their communication in this split safety zone heavy defense is is really impressive. And I I do think McDermott is excellent at communicating the coverage responsibilities to these guys in the back end. It allows them to play smart and play fast. And in this game, the coverage was really good. Uh, Christian Benford, by the way, um, it's not just the coaching. Christian Benford, I think, is emerging as a star corner. I've been very hesitant on the sixth round pick out of Villanova that had to kind of beat out Tyler Elam. He's he might be their best defensive player right now. I mean, Russo's having a good year, um, you know, at Oliver's at Oliver, but you know, with Milano out Teron Johnson out right now, you can make a very strong case that Christian Benford is their best player and entering star status. So I wanted to give him credit as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, this defense is, is impressive. We, we mentioned the, the communication, the coverage on the back end, but they also, historically have been very good against the run and they do that by living in nickel and playing too high coverage. So that, that does require very smart linebackers, good coaching, good gap discipline, and they're very good there too. So I, I will bills fans give Sean McDermott his full praise this week. I'm going to back off on the McDermott hate. That's looking like a bad take of mine that this was going to be his last year in Buffalo. Um, that seems very far fetched at this point. So I uh, just, Everything's firing um, full cylinder right now in in Buffalo, and they play the Ravens this upcoming weekend. What a fun game that's going to be. But let's talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars. So their upcoming schedule is Houston and Indianapolis, and I think if they go 0-5, it would be malpractice not to fire Doug Peterson. I mean, you guys can all see it, right? We've seen it for the better part of a year now the way the team collapsed last year this is eerily familiar to what happened in philadelphia the lack of you know the blocking schemes the quarterback self imploding it's all the same shit that happened in philadelphia they got to turn this thing around like this 
or it's time for Doug Peterson to get out of here. And it just sucks because, well, I was going to say it sucks because you have Trevor Lawrence, but even Trevor Lawrence isn't playing well. So it just, it just all sucks, period. Like, we all feel your pain, Jags fans. It, it does not look fun um, to be a Jaguars fan, and, and it comes back to Trent Baalke, to You know, in this game, the offense struggled, of course, but the defense was maybe even worse. And that Trent bulky built defensive line was nowhere to be found. Absolutely nowhere to be found. And the Bills offensive line deserves credit, but Trayvon Walker, eh. Uh, even Josh Allen had a bad game in this one going against Deion Dawkins. Eric Armstead, where are you at? Their second round pick, Mason Smith, looking like a developmental reach that shouldn't be getting 25 snaps right out the gate. Like me and pretty much every draft analyst kind of said on that one, right? Um, uh, 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 the D tackle uh, to, to um, Hamilton, who they're paying. None of these guys did shit. You're putting way too much pressure on a poorly built secondary, which can question their moves back there as well. Um, yeah, it's it's just a disaster, man. There's there's no way around it. Really hard to see, but. You also got to put some blame on Trevor Lawrence um, or, or not even necessarily blame. Like, I don't know how many quarterbacks are going to save this situation, but Lawrence himself is not playing well and he's not helping the situation look better. The, the, the inconsistency from a processing and decision making standpoint is frustrating. But in this game, it was like, when it was still a ball game, the missed throws, the missed throws, can't, that, that, that cannot be happening with Trevor Lawrence. It, are inaccurate passes hurting his performance? The idea of Trevor Lawrence is he's got the golden arm, right? This dude has elite arm talent, and you develop the, the mental side of things, and you're going to get a great quarterback. If if he's not putting the ball on his receivers, and, and this has become a recurring issue at this point, is accuracy, inconsistency with him. It just drops the floor on him so much. And in this game, you know, they're, they're trying to drive. They're trying to match the, the Bills offense. They are doing that early in this game. And they're, they're, he's trying to throw a back shoulder on third and eight to Gabe Davis, I think. But it's like, it's not even catchable, right? It's a decent look. If the ball was thrown accurately, you, you technically would have put the ball in a spot where it was either going to be Gabe Davis or no one else towards the sideline. It was good coverage, but that's what these great quarterbacks do, right? You put the back shoulder on the guy. He, he just puts it three yards out of bounds, and Gabe Davis has to drift, drift out of bounds to try to catch it. It's like, dude, that's a, it's a big third eight, third and eight in a big spot for your winless Jaguars team. Like, make the damn throw. Put it on him. And then the interception to DeMar Hamlin, I mean, whoever had that tweet that was saying Trevor Lawrence became the first quarterback in NFL history to throw an interception to someone who has died. Yeah, that, that, one, that was tweet of the year right there. That was incredible. Um, but just lean pocket, wide ass open over route. And he sails it, what, 10 yards over, was it Christian Kirk's head? And it gets intercepted. Like, dude, you can't be doing that. And then you, you take that and put it on the context of what we said coming into the year where we looked at last season and he was coming off a great sophomore campaign, right? And last year, I mean, he got the, the contract extension based on his sophomore season and the fact that he had this four-minute cut-up of all these plays where you could string it together and be like, Look, the process is so good. He's just like a millisecond away from connecting on all these big plays. And some of them were like Calvin Ridley, just not catching balls he should catch. You, you can't say this about every play in that cut up. But I do think now that we're seeing the accuracy stuff and the way he's throwing some of these balls, it's like, is, is he just not hitting his mark on these? Like, yes, he's very close to hitting these guys, but you do got to put it on your receiver. That's his job, especially as this $55 million quarterback. So 
I mean, that just puts a whole nother like wrinkle in this entire Jags situation is it's one thing if Trevor was playing well and you could say, all right, well, let's blow it up. Let's try this again with Trevor on this fresh contract. Um, kind of like what the Chargers have done with Justin Herbert. It's a whole nother thing if the guy's not playing well, right? Because then it's like, well, well, we'll start over. We'll try to build around Trevor and then we'll find out if Trevor can play well. They're in such a shitty spot right now and it just sucks. Uh, it's really hard to watch. So, and I, I don't see this stopping anytime soon. Like they feel like they're in free fall at the moment, but things can change quickly in the NFL. We shall find out. Let's go ahead and move on to a Sunday game between the Houston Texans and the Minnesota Vikings. This was the first Sunday game I wanted to talk about. Man, the Vikings are so fun. They're so fun. This defense, especially. And, and the Sam Darnold thing's fun, too. We'll talk about that. But this defense is especially just the, the, the type of aesthetic that I think we all want to watch. Brian Flores blitzed 26 out of 60 snaps in this game. That was by far the highest percentage uh, in the week among any team. And on the season, he has blitzed by far the most out of any team in the league. And... His ability, Brian Flores, to out scheme and outmatch two offensive coordinators that we just think the absolute world of, right? Kyle Shanahan and Bobby Slowick. It's just so impressive. And for that guy to not even be your head coach when your head coach is also an absolute stud doing great things for the offense, I just don't have words to describe how amazing that is. For the Vikings, you can make a very strong case. This is the best coached team in the league currently on, it, it, when you have to factor in both sides of the ball. I think the only other team that has a strong case for that would be the Kansas City Chiefs. But this game plan, this blitzing plan against two Shanahan-style offenses, right, that want to run the wide zone, they want to use the threat of play action to set up these deep crossers, um, use play action to help their offensive line. I've talked about this, but I'll, re I'll reiterate this point. A main reason we discuss these Shanahan style systems elevating poor offensive line, like we've seen in Houston, in San Francisco, Miami, another example of this is when you run play action, you're forcing the opposing team to play with their stand up run defense technique because they think it's a run, right? as opposed to going into your drop back passing game where these linemen can just get up field, tee off, and pass rush. So when you're running play action, you're getting linemen moving horizontally before they can go vertical. And when you blitz, that's not the case, right? So there's a reason this is impacting these offenses. And maybe we see more of this around the league, but it, it, it's not as simple as Brian Flores is just blitzing a bunch, right? It's, it's the different formations, the different directions he's sending things in and uh, sending things from. And honestly, what is maybe even more impressive than the blitz designs from Brian Flores, which are very impressive, is how effective the 34 plays where he doesn't blitz are. Because he's blitzing so much that the, the offense has become terrified of it. It's wrecking their game plans. But when they drop seven, six, seven, eight guys into coverage, a lot of times he's pressing that coverage button. Brian Flores is pressing that coverage button. At the same time, when the offense is dialing up a seven-man protection to, to try and counter the blitz. So you end up with seven on three on the back end and can just lock dudes down. And eventually you're going to get home with your four man rush, but it's, there's another layer to this. When Brian Flores is dropping six, seven guys into coverage, he's not just coming out in an even front rushing evenly four guys. He's doing it from these uh, simulated pressure looks 
and he's able to get free rushers. He's running stunts and, and sending loopers to disrupt blocking schemes. So you're forcing the team to keep extra blockers in, but then pulling back out, dropping seven into coverage to cover three dudes, while also still using that fear factor of the blitz to confuse the opposing team's passing protection. We are watching defensive mastermind stuff type of, type of stuff here. He is inevitably, undoubtedly the best defensive coordinator in the league right now and would, would be a top 10 head coach in the NFL as well as he was in Miami, assuming someone could get in his ear and help them get the offense right. Um, it's, it's, it's spectacular. So had to give Brian Flores more credit. I, I can't keep doing this same segment every single week, uh, but I, I at least wanted to do that one more time. But we might just have to hit the retweet button on that whole segment as we go, up, go throughout the course of the season because I don't see any signs of this slowing down. We do, ha- however, get to watch him again against one of the most highly respected offensive minds in the league this week in Green Bay against Matt LaFleur, and I'm very excited to see you know, Matt LaFleur is going to lose some sleep this week um, trying to put together a game plan of how to beat this. And this is what makes football so interesting is this chess match is what types of schematic answers is Brian Flores, uh, sorry, is, is uh, Matt LaFleur going to have for Brian Flores? Very, very much looking forward to that. But then, of course, there's the other side of this, the offense, Kevin O'Connell, Sam Darnold, offensive mastermind type of stuff. They're doing such a good job of allowing Sam Darnold to settle in um there's a lot of easy buttons getting pressed here the run game's working but they're also just like the deep cross to justin jefferson a perfect example a simple concept play action you're using a couple of underneath hook routes to suck in those linebackers so the play action sucks them in the hook routes suck them in o'connell's able to predict that he's gonna get cover three and then just have Justin Jefferson burn over the top of those guys on a crossing route. All Darnold has to do is look around, make sure the structure of the play is working, clean pocket because it's play action, no one's rushing upfield, boom, on the money. But I think you're seeing the confidence level of Sam Darnold kick up. You're starting to see a little bit of that swagger that he had at USC, which he, he, you, got, you got to go back four or five years ago, but this dude was a baller at USC. He really, really was playmaking feel, the savviness in the pocket, very, very underrated athleticism, um, a great arm. And that's, I think, the bit, the most impressive thing about Sam Darnold so far is the thing that he's always been praised for has been a thing here, and that is the, the great arm talent and the elite ball placement that he does have. The touchdown pass to Jalen Naylor on a crossing route is it's tight coverage, but he's putting it right in front of the guy for a catchable touchdown pass. Um, the fourth passing touchdown in this game was was needled in between a tight window down in the red zone. Um, There's a couple out routes in this game that were just out of the reach of defenders that were just great ball placement. Um, and then some of the play extension in this game, we, we hinted at it already, but he made some big plays with his feet uh, that helped them kind of cement this blowout. Right, right off the gate, he's got the play action, uh, the the play extension touchdown down in the red zone where it's covered up. He rolls up, steps left, buys time, sees Justin Jefferson open, hits him for the touchdown. You also had a third and twenty in this game. Texans feel like they've got the Vikings dead to rights in a position to maybe start to wage a comeback, and Darnold steps up in the pocket, fires it in in between the middle of of the of the defense. Not a perfect throw; it was a little bit low, but it was good enough on the run to. It was a 19-yard completion on third and 20. They end up going for it and getting it on fourth down. So he is making some big plays, playing within the structure of this offense that's doing a great job to support him. And this is is getting real. This is getting very real. I do want to note that he's still making a couple plays every week where you kind of hold your breath a little bit, and you're like, I kind of looked like the old Sam Darnold. Um. In this game, he forced a go ball into double coverage, got away with it, 
And then he also had a play where he's trying to check it down. He's getting hit while he throws it, and it kind of rolls out to the check down. Brandon Powell ends up picking it up and getting it like eight yards out of it. But, uh, you know, there's a couple plays where he's a little loose with the football. And I think the hope is you can see less and less in those, less and less of those as he gets more comfortable with the team, more comfortable with the offense, um, gets, you know, gets Jordan Addison back, gets TJ Hawkinson back. Like, the hope is if those start to go away and all the other stuff stays, like I said, this is getting very, very real. And if he plays at this level or even better because he's getting those guys back, this is only his third game in this offense, you better believe that this team is going to be thinking about giving him a significant contract extension. And you better believe that it would be a significant contract extension because I think he's playing better than Baker, than, um, well, Gino, Gino's tough because I think Gino in the first half of that breakout season in Seattle played a, at a top five quarterback level. And then the second half, he dropped off a little bit. So, you, you know, it's, it's just a different scenario. And we're, we're going to have to just wait and see how long Sam Donald can sustain this, of course. But let's pretend Sam Donald continues to play as about the, 12th best quarterback in the NFL. Just kind of projecting things out a little bit. I would say that's roughly how this would land. That's better than Baker and better than Gino. And I think he has an allure around the NFL that this was always possible with him as well because he just never had a circumstance conducive to his success, right? Um, so you better believe that that extension would be expensive. And you better believe that the Vikings aren't going to just let him go. I, I tweeted this out, and a lot of Vikings fans were coming at me. I, I said, we are nearing a point where we should start discussing if J.J. McCarthy is the number one quarterback in this upcoming draft class. We'll see how this ages, right? Donald's going to have to keep this up. And the other side of this is this quarterback class the college season needs to go on without any of these guys really emerging as the clear cut quarterbacks. But I think at this point in time, there's not really a clear QB one. And certainly no one you're saying is going to be like a, a locked top 10, top 15 pick right now. So if things keep playing out this way, the Vikings, I do think will be near damn near forced to extend Sam Darnold. Because for all of the Vikings fans saying, oh, they believe in J.J. McCarthy. He looked so good in that one preseason game. Like, the coaches have said he's the future of this team. Have people really learned nothing about coach speak over the years? And learned nothing about how quickly things can change in this league? I guarantee you, they would have said the same thing about Trey Lance. Not saying J.J. McCarthy is Trey Lance. I'm just saying that... Of course the Vikings are going to say, we believe in the guy we just drafted 10th overall. And of course they're going to say he's the future of their team. That, it's not that they're lying, it's just that that means literally nothing. So that's a crazy argument that people are like, no, but the Vikings coaches said a month ago, before Sam Donald started playing well, that JJ's their guy. Things can and will change very quickly in this league. And I think... For the Vikings, who have, this is not some brand new staff, right? Like O'Connell, Quasi, they've been waiting to be great for a while now. I don't think they care where that quarterback comes from, but they're ready. And they are not going to go through a whole year of Sam Darnold playing well and then let him walk it. You know, he's 28 years old. He's not that old. He can very realistically have a 10-year window of success in Minnesota if this continues. Again, I have to keep making that point. I recognize that Darnold has been a streaky bad quarterback in his career, and that guy could come back. We're just having this conversation in the lens of what if this continues? Because he does look better than he ever has in his career. Um, you better believe the Vikings are going to be giving him a probably a three-year... It, it would be north of what Baker got because that the QB market just jumped up with all these extensions. So it would probably be a three-year, 140, you know, what, what would be like 46 a year 
times three. 138, three year, 138 million with like the first year guaranteed, the second year like half guaranteed and the third year not really guaranteed at all would probably be the structure of this. And if that's a contract they're going to give, they're going to have two, option with, two options with J.J. McCarthy. They can Jordan love him, just sit him, um, let him develop and let the Sam Darnold thing play out. That's a good, that's a good avenue. Or let's say they have an 11-win season. They feel really good about this team. Let's say they look at next year as a year they can take a big leap and be a legit Super Bowl team. You don't think they'll be tempted after they just gave Sam Darnold that contract to be like, you know what? There's no quarterbacks in this draft. The Titans have the seventh pick. Um, they're willing to do a first, you know, they're, they're willing to move that pick in some regard. You'd probably have to give something back. I don't think you're going to get the seventh pick in the draft for J.J. McCarthy. But let's say they're able to get a high-end corner prospect or uh, a great pass rushing prospect, something like that, a Mason Graham to put on this team. You don't think they'll be tempted by that? I think they absolutely will. And this is, I mean, it's very similar to the Niners with Trey Lance in that they didn't really care where that great quarterback came from. All they cared what, was that they got one, right, in Brock Purdy. And they moved on from the guy that they gave up three first-round picks for and spent the third overall pick or fourth overall pick, whatever it was, on Trey Lance. This is nothing compared to that. All they did was spend one first-round pick on him. People were like, they traded up for J.J. McCarthy. They're not going to just sell on him. They hardly traded up. They gave up a fourth round pick to move from 11 to 10 or whatever it was. Like, no, it's not really trading up. They just moved up a little bit to ensure they could get him. That is nothing. And if you turn around and flip that into a, a great first round pick the next year, everyone's going to applaud you for it. Right? So this is, this is a real conversation. I really think it is. And Vikings fans are just dismissing it. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know, man. It's very, very fascinating, though. And I'm, I'm glad we kind of hit on it. We'll see where it goes. I mean, Donald's got to keep this up if any of this is going to come to fruition, right? But let's talk about Houston. I, I'm not going to dog on them. I'm not going to pile on. It, it was not their day. They clearly were not prepared. They did not have a good game plan for a very unique defensive scheme. If they run into this again, they're going to have to be more prepared to beat the Blitz. Beyond that, I'm not really going to panic. Um, I think it was just a bad day at the office, on the road. By the way, in a home environment, people that have been following the podcast, how long have I been saying the Minnesota Vikings underrated, like, top three home field advantage in the NFL? They had a, a sequence of events where the Texans had three false starts, killed a drive, and then you have... Also, they're like teeing off on the silent count. There's a play where Jihad Ward is lined up as a three tech. sees the center do the, you know, ass tap thing, gets ready for the snap. And he's past the center as the ball's getting snapped, like times it up perfectly. Like that is home field, baby. Um, but anyway, a very tough road trip for the Houston Texans. I, everybody wants to blame the quarterback in a game like this. I don't think Stroud was particularly bad. I saw a YouTube comment from the power rankings of like, how are you not saying Stroud played poor? He threw two picks. And I'm like, well, one got tipped. Like he got, he had bad luck on a tipped interception too. Like that is just bad luck. <laughs> and then he, he, in the fourth quarter down by three scores, he forces a ball that he probably wouldn't normally throw and it gets picked. So I'm not going to look too far into those two interceptions. I think this was more about like, they just didn't have a good game plan. They got out coached. They got caught off guard. They had a bad day at the office. I don't think the defense was horrible. You know, it's a good Vikings offense. Donald played well, made some tough throws. I'm expecting the Texans to bounce back. So I, I don't have too much to say on the Houston Texans side of things. I think this is a burn the tape game. If some of the, if some of this stuff continues, we'll, we'll revisit it, but I think they'll bounce back. Okay. Next up. We have the Baltimore Ravens at the Dallas Cowboys. What looked like a blowout early, and then the Cowboys kind of storm back. They give the Ravens another scare, just like they had last week. Ravens fans, I think, had a heart attack, because this has been the theme on them. And you don't love to see it, but they did put the game away very late. 
in this one. They they botched an onside kick to allow this recovery to happen. It's like always something new with the Baltimore Ravens, but overall a very good day for Baltimore. And I will say, so great game plan to identify Dallas and their weakness, right? That Dallas has proven that they cannot stop the run. But a great job by Baltimore to be like, you know, actually have a plan offensively. That's been something I've been looking for with the Ravens. They've, they've had some big plays. They've had some exciting moments. They've had success. Lamar won an MVP. But it's like, what is it that you do here? Like, what is your thing? When you look at the construction of this roster, as I've been saying, they're actually still kind of built to run a Greg Roman-style offense. 12 personnel, 13 personnel, 22 personnel. Run the ball, play action, throw the ball to your tight ends, running backs. Right? Like, that was the Greg Roman thing. And again, this is not saying Lamar can't run the spread stuff, run the pro-style stuff. He did that last year, and it worked. But they haven't continued to add upon that. All they did was let the offensive line get worse. So dropping back 45 times a game and letting Lamar beat you from the pocket is going to be harder for them because of the construction of this roster. So they come out and say, yeah, okay, Greg Roman's not here, but let's kind of go back to our roots a little bit. And this week, I looked these up. They were in 22 personnel, which is two tight ends, two running backs, or in the case here, obviously, a fullback being... Um, uh, I almost said Zach Sealer. That would have been... Could have seen that, but um, Patrick Ricard. So... You've got 22 personnel, 13 out of 16 plays, so almost 25% of the time. They were in 21 personnel, which is Ricard, a running back, and a tight end. Uh, 16 out of 60 plays, so over 25% of the time. And they were in 12 personnel, which is going to be two tight ends, which was either going to be... Andrews and likely or Kohler and likely or Kohler and Andrews. They have three tight ends. They were in that 11 times out of 60. So just 19 out of 60 plays, less than a third of their snaps. They were in traditional 11 personnel, which is what they would have been in much more often last year. Uh, they were the third least in 11 personnel this week behind Miami and Pittsburgh. So. They came out and just loaded up, ran the ball. They had 274 rushing yards. They dropped back just 17 times out of 60 plays in this game, just 15 pass attempts for Lamar. A wide receiver saw just 10 targets. This was, it wasn't a Greg Roman offense. It wasn't a, you know, a, the same plays, right? But the same approach where we're just going to beat the shit out of you. And this lean into that being the strength of this roster, because it really is offensively the depth they have at tight end, plus one of the best fullbacks in the league, plus Derrick Henry in the backfield, plus the threat of Lamar, who is at his best as a passer off of play action attack in the middle of the field. Um, that's, that's an identity that they can have that I think will work more than just on Dallas. And that's where I'm especially curious here. Was this just a weekly game plan? Hey, Dallas can't match us. Next week, we're going right back to 11 personnel. Or are they going to lean into this? I'm very curious to see against the Buffalo Bills what the plan is here. The Bills are a team that wants to live in nickel personnel. They're beat up at linebacker. Um, can, they, can they do this again? Or are they going to kind of go back to the Lamar dropback stuff? A big, big thing to keep an eye on heading into next week. Um, I, I want to shout out, though, Charlie Kolar again. Getting used here, 26 snaps in this game. He had a big catch and run, and I thought he was blocking his ass off. And Kolar was one of my favorite draft prospects. Someone, I, I mean, if you lined up like the 10 guys, my 10 absolute my guys, guys that I was way higher on than consensus, I had a second, maybe a second to a third round grade on Charlie Kolar but he was close to a top 50 player in that draft class for me. And uh, when the Ravens got him, I was like, you know, the meme of the blonde girl that's like, mm, eh, mm, mm. you know, that was me with Charlie Kolar. Cause I'm like, on one hand, 
the tight uh, the the Ravens do develop tight ends extremely well. And I think we saw some development from Kolar as a blocker in this game. That was not really his thing come out, coming out of Iowa State. But on the other hand, it was like, man, he's never going to play because they have Mark Andrews, Isaiah Likely, who was drafted. Um, uh, Kolar might have been drafted before Likely, but Kolar was hurt and Likely, you know, kind of broke out as well. So anyway... Um, and then Patrick Ricard, they use as a fullback and they'll even put him out as a tight end at times. But in a game plan like this, you'll get Kolar rotating in as a quasi starter. So really excited to see him show his explosiveness through the air. Just one catch. Um, but I think they can do more with him there. And then the blocking as well. Really fun, fun dude, fun player, uh, six foot seven with, with uh, six foot seven athlete with speed. I'm not I'm not done believing in Charlie Kolar. We we're just starting to see the first of him, I think. Uh and then the Ravens defense played really well as well. Uh they they gave up a bunch uh on the comeback trail from Dallas, but a really strong start. They've been good really the last couple of weeks. Uh other than, you know, the the comeback against the Raiders too. As for Dallas, it's like nothing new to see here. Uh, they're getting ran all over. It's a tired narrative at this point. But, you know, I think Cowboys fans are tired of it. They don't have any answers. I don't have any answers for you. That's above my pay grade. That is Mike Zimmer's job to figure out how to stop the run. Um, you know, Mazzy Smith has not been as advertised. He's been so disappointing based on what he did in college and, and what he was supposed to be. I don't know. I don't understand. What's going on there? Why he's just a non-factor, a, a liability really against the run. He played a bunch in this game and, and could not get off a block. And then Demarion Overshone, look, Cowboys fans, I, I know you like him. And he could be a really fun coverage linebacker someday. But until the rest of this run defense gets better, if they're asking him to play the run like they're doing right now, it's going to be ugly. And it has been ugly the last two weeks for Demarion Overshone. Uh, He's, he's just, he's not the answer to what their issues are. They thought maybe Maris Luafau was going to be that guy. I don't know. I, 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 counting on him was, was interesting to say the least from Dallas. I thought that was a massive reach, but uh, yeah, I, I just don't have great answers there defensively for them. Uh, it's an issue. Teams, teams that can do this, you know, the, the saints, the Ravens, come out in heavy personnel and just gash you. They're going to be able to do that against Dallas, I think. They're, they're going to be a very matchup-dependent team until they can prove otherwise. Offensively for Dallas, uh, they fell behind early. I, I don't think Dak had a good game. I don't think he had his worst game. Wasn't very sharp early. Got better as the game went on. You know, they're, they're trying to find out who else is going to step up in this offense. And honestly, on, on this comeback... In this comeback, they they had some guys make make some plays. Devontae Turpin, um, Jalen Tolbert made made some catches down the stretch. Uh, the fullback Hunter Lepke was like dynamic in this game. Uh, but are any of those guys going to be consistent options for them? They tried to get Brandon Cooks going. He again was kind of bottled up. So. It's good to see them get some plays from guys and great to see Jake Ferguson back in the lineup. He's really good, man. I really like Jake Ferguson. Uh, he made some really nice uh, catch and run plays in this game. Um, and maybe that's enough to just have DD and Ferguson and, and the game plans a little different w without getting gashed on the ground against a different team. But again, I, I don't know. I don't know if they can avoid that game plan too much because the the, the, the book is out, right? Like, j if you run 12 personnel and just run right at these guys, they don't have an answer right now. And until they can find one, Dallas is going to have a hard time, like, even making the playoffs this year. I think they'll bounce back Thursday night against the Giants, but I, I don't think that is uh, an answer to their questions, just beating the Giants. All right, let's go to our next game here. The New York Jets, Thursday night football, playing the New England Patriots. I, I, I'll just get New England out of the, ray, the way. I just don't have really anything to say about them. Rough, rough night. I, honestly, I just don't have a positive for New England. It, it's, I, I'm sorry, Patriots fans. 
I, I know you want me to come out and have some take. I just, I just don't. Like the offensive line is horrible. Jacoby is Jacoby. The defense is just beat up. They tried. Uh, they tried their best, but there wasn't any like standout performances for me in this game. Just nothing really to take away in this one. I, I just pray that you don't throw Drake May to the Wolves. Please don't throw Drake, Drake May to the Wolves. This, this is looking much more like that catastrophic bad football team that I expected uh, coming into the year after they, you know, they were competitive. They, they won their first game of the year, but it, it kind of reminds me. Uh, I'm not going to be able to think of it. There was a team recently. It might've been the Jags. I think it might've been the Jags. Yeah. When they ended up getting Trevor Lawrence, I think they won their first game of the year against the Colts and then ended up going like one in 15 or something. This kind of reminds me of that. But this night was all about the New York Jets. And I'll go kind of quickly through this because this was a week ago at this point. But, and, and by the way, I, now that I'm kind of back on my feet a little bit, uh, trying to recover from the, the deep dive push, I'm hoping to have like more like two, two podcasts a week type of stuff. Maybe not every week, but having... Um, like this week, I'm going to have a Matthew Collar episode and I'm going to try to do more mailbag podcasts. You guys actually didn't come in big time with the mailbags this week. I think I got three mailbag messages. So Patreon, if you guys want to send in your mailbag episodes, please do. But anyway, my goal is to have more often. Can't promise it every week, but maybe Fridays, Saturday mornings have like a recap, a Thursday night recap, plus either a mailbag or a guest is something I'm kind of building towards. And, and maybe I can make that a more consistent two times a week thing. Um, I just don't want to commit to it right now as I'm talking out loud, but just something to look forward to for the podcast here. But anyway, let's revisit Thursday night football here. Uh, all about Aaron Rodgers, right? On the podcast last week, I was saying, you know, the Jets look okay, but Aaron doesn't look like it, it didn't look like the world where Aaron Rodgers was going to be kind of back and look like a top six quarterback. Because in the deep dive, I projected that as a possibility that this ankle was really going to recover well. And we talked about last week, like he's he really wasn't moving in the first two weeks. And it felt like he was playing well, like a top half of the league quarterback was going to give them a chance to have a successful season. But that the idea that he was going to be kind of a top six kind of pro bowl caliber quarterback, if you will, for whatever that means, um, you know, that, that possibility felt like a long shot, certainly, uh, if not was being completely written off. And then Thursday night happened and it's like, well, throw that out the window. I mean, this was all about Aaron Rodgers extending plays. Well, I can't say all about Aaron Rodgers extending plays, but that was the big takeaway was like, dude, He's out there moving, he's breaking stacks, he's making throws on the run. Looked like maybe 2020 Aaron Rodgers, MVP Aaron Rodgers. Huge, huge news for the Jets to see him trusting the ankle and doing that kind of stuff. Because, you know, the, the defense played well in this game against a measly Patriots offense. They played better last week against the Titans offense. I don't know how impressive that is, how much to take away from that. It doesn't, to me, at this point in time, feel like this is going to be a top five defense. I still think they're a good defense, but the Hassan Reddick situation is getting weird. Aaron Rodgers is, like, taking shots at his agent slash him. I, I, I don't know if you guys saw that on the Pat McAfee show. I saw the clip that they were, like, asking Aaron, what did you think of the article where the person wrote that the Jets' locker room is... A night like a disaster before the year. And Aaron's answer was, sounds like Hassan Reddick's agent or former agent may have written that. It was like, hmm. So do they just hate Hassan Reddick because he's not playing for them? I, I just don't know where the hell that's gonna go. And I think that's a a big deal with Jermaine Johnson out for the year. Like that pass rush is a is a big part of that defense. Now Quinn and Williams played better this week and they still have a great secondary and Robert Sala, like they're gonna be a good defense, but are they gonna be this top three defense that only needs an average offense to be a Super Bowl team. 
the the script seems like it's kind of flipping on the Jets, where they maybe if they're going to win a Super Bowl, they kind of need Thursday night's version of Aaron Rodgers, where teams don't have answers for him because, as I mentioned, it wasn't just the play extension where he looks so good. He has been surgical. He's been picking teams apart. This idea that the play calling was going to feel way better with Aaron in there, just kind of running his offense. Um, that's coming to fruition. Not that this is like great pl- play calling or anything, but they've gone from 32nd in offensive play calling to maybe 18th. And that's helping the offense there. Um, pass protection has been great, but like what I'm getting at here is it's feeling more like this is going to need to be maybe top 10 on both sides of the ball or top six offensively and top 15 defensively. But the thing is with Aaron playing like this, that is feasible. I really think it is, especially when Alan Lazard's actually playing well, you've got Braylon Allen and the run game looking like a factor. They're getting Mike Williams involved more and more every week. And another thing too, is the Garrett Wilson Rogers connection. You got to remember these guys are only, they've only played three games together. Like that should only get better as the year goes on. And they're very close. They're very close on some of these back shoulders, some of the timing throws. Don't rule that out on being a more dynamic connection as we move forward. Um, It's very rare for Aaron to just click with a wide receiver like that. It it has always taken time, but they're close and he's trusting them. So um, that throw, by the way, for the touchdown. Woo. What a dot. Anyway, um, the script is flipping, flipping a little bit on the Jets, but, but in, in an exciting way. And uh, excited to see where this goes. I think that's all we got. Yeah, that's all we got for the uh, Thursday night game. So next up, I have the Bears-Colts battle. Um, a low-scoring game that opened up late. Final score, Colts 21. They get their first win on the year over the Bears. Let's start on the Colts side of things, the winning squad here. I, I love the tweet that said, Anthony Richardson can make throws that 99% of NFL quarterbacks can't make. The 1% being probably Josh Allen, maybe Patrick Mahomes. But he also can't make throws that 99% of quarterbacks can make. And that is just such a true overall statement of what the Anthony Anthony Richardson experience has really been in the league so far. It was there last year, and it's been there this year. Just ugly, ugly overthrows in this game. Uh, I I counted a couple really costly ones, and this is not mentioned in the ones where he's just a little bit off, but the interception was ugly. He's stepping up, tries to make a tough but possible throw into the middle of the field, throwing across his body a little bit, but not all the way across his body. And he just sails it eight yards over, I think, Alec Pierce's head. Uh, or it might have been Adonai Mitchell's head. But it gets intercepted by Jalen Jones. Or uh, by uh, uh, Jalen Johnson. Yeah, Jalen Jones on one side, Jalen Johnson on the other side. Keep that straight. But... Ugly interception, and then he has a, a, a big three and out in this game. You know, fortunately, they ended up winning this game, but a big three and out in this game, just trying to flip it out to Jonathan Taylor. Taylor has to like overextend, and he barely gets his fingertips on it, and they ended up punting. He also got very lucky. It's not just the inaccurate throws. The last couple of weeks, we've seen some of the turnover where they play mistakes start to stack up on Richardson. He made some ugly decisions in the Packers game. And in this game, he just wasn't willing to let a play die. He was doing some of the kind of early Josh Allen stuff where he thinks he can get out of every sack. He had so many turnovers early in his career. Allen has fortunately gotten way, way smarter at this, and you're hoping that can happen with Richardson over time. Um, but, you know, he's wrapped up. He's getting twisted. He's like, oh, I can get out of this, and he's doing this. And then another rusher comes in, nails him, and they ended up looking at it saying um, Richardson was trying to throw it. It was very, very close. Very, very close to being what could have been a a game-changing play in this one. Got very lucky on that one. So in the last 20 minutes of this game, the Colts basically said, 
screw it. We're just going to run the ball. Like, we'll go back to the drawing board this week, but we can't trust Richardson to throw the ball right now. And uh, it worked. <laughs> it absolutely worked. Their run game is fantastic. I think for the second week in a row, Jonathan Taylor looks fully back to me. Like, honestly, I, I know they paid him, and he's been, like, pretty good. But I had yet to be, like, there he is on Jonathan Taylor. Like, you think back to that huge year he had where he was just so fast and explosive, breaking talent, uh, breaking Ross, jeez, uh, breaking at a total just brain fart there. Um, but uh, just breaking tackles and, um, you know, had like offensive player of the year type of season. Like, that guy hadn't been there for a couple of years. I'm not saying he's all the way back, but you can really see the juice in Jonathan Taylor, which is exciting, especially when the offensive line is playing like this. Richardson is a major threat in the run game. I do still think what we said week one about how he's just running harder and with more determination and more speed. I do think that is showing up. He had a, he had a big run late in this game to help put it away. So you're at least, you know, it's not like Richardson's a complete flop or anything, or you're in a complete panic mode. He's probably not where you were hoping he would be after what we saw week one. Um, and you got to limit these mistakes. You got to find a way to improve the accuracy. It's very, very Josh Allen -y from early in Josh Allen's career. Um, it's almost like, well, Shane Steichen's there, but it would be like a dream if like Brian Dable got fired in New York and you could maybe bring him in as like the offensive coordinator to work with Josh, uh, with, with Anthony Richardson. That would be like a dream, but it's like, you got to replicate the Josh Allen plan. In the meantime, they're going to run the ball and try to play defense and win games like this and slowly build things up uh, without him kind of self-combusting and becoming a bust. Um, but yeah, in this game, that, that game plan worked. And the defense played really well. Uh, shout out Latu Latu. Gets a big strip sack on Caleb Williams late in this game to kind of put the game away. Great play. It was on a tight end trying to block him. So take that with a grain of salt. But Latu has been very good out the gate. Love to see that. Uh, I've got defensive player of the year, uh, defensive rookie of the year bets on him. And then shout out Jalen Jones as well. So they lost Juju Brents, their young corner for the season. Not Jalen Jones really stepped up in this game. I just have always liked Jalen Jones. He's kind of like a small pat on the back as like a day three guy that I kind of feel like no one was talking about him. And I called him out as uh, yeah, I think I had a third or fourth round grade on him. And uh, he's lived up to that. Like he's been a good starting corner in the NFL. He's not the most dynamic coverage player. He's not very fast, but he's very heady, very Rasul Douglasy, where he's, he's a playmaker. He feels out zones really well. Good ball skills. Two interceptions in this game. One, he wasn't in coverage on the play. It was Nick Cross in coverage, but he was coming over, reacting to the play, and then really good like balance and ball skills to secure the interception uh, after the deflection. But uh, yeah, Colts defense played well. They're going to be kind of a week to week, season long evaluation. Really, I, I don't think they're going to be like a playoff team and, and reach that type of ceiling, um, at least early. They, they can still get there, but they, get, they need to see some development from Anthony Richardson for sure. But uh, talk about a quarterback uh, and a team that needs to see some development from their quarterback. Um, you know, Caleb just hasn't been where we thought he and this Bears offense would be. It's not full scale panic. And I do want to call out the idiots on social media already like writing off Caleb Williams. I saw the, the big viral one today was a four-piece screenshot of Bryce Young next to C.J. Stroud and then Caleb Williams next to Jaden Daniels. And it's like, history repeated itself. Like, can we not? Like, can we please just not? <laughs> you can celebrate how good Jaden Daniels looks without being an idiot when it comes to Caleb Williams. He's three starts into this thing, and I don't even think he's been that bad. Like, this hasn't been a Bryce Young disaster. He's not living up to the crazy hype we put on him. That is absolutely true, and he's making some mistakes. He made some mistakes in this game that you don't want to see. Right? He has another big overthrow in this game, and I, think, I will say that is the big surprise for me on Caleb Williams is... 
I felt like the accuracy was the last thing you were going to worry about with Caleb. And this kind of happened to Bryce Young too, by the way. He was super accurate in college, and now he's just not. But, you know, Caleb isn't 5'9", <laughs> so that should help over time. But he has been missing throws that he wasn't missing in college. He just, I mean, I charted every game of Caleb Williams in college. It was a rarity to see him overthrow it, throw a dude. And oftentimes when he did, it was like, yeah, he's kind of covered. I'm just going to kind of leave it out there. If the receiver goes and makes a play, great. It, it was like a smart throwaway type of deal. But these are, he's missing like open throws. He did it in the preseason. He's done it in the regular season. In this game, it was to Adunze on a big third down in the third quarter. Like, you got to hit it. I think he will hit it in the future. But for some reason, and it could be a confidence thing. He's in his head a little bit. I don't see anything mechanically that's different. He's just got to hit that, right? So we'll continue to monitor that. But it's certainly a small enough. Like that, Jaden Daniels, the first two weeks was overthrowing balls. So who's to say Caleb in week four isn't going to come out and start hitting those throws? You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to panic about it. He's got to start hitting him it, uh, hitting it. It's very similar to what Jaden started doing this week. And then he, had, he did have the very bad pick that came right after the biggest throw he's made <laughs> as a bear. He, he, has a, he has a dime of a throw to a Dunze for a big play and then immediately turns around and throws a really stupid pick to the sideline uh, where Jalen Jones was just sitting on it. Um, can't have that, right? Can't be late to the flat like that. So he's, he's, he has a couple bad plays in this game, but overall, I, I don't think he was specifically bad. Um, it, it's, it, it really is like the team, the idea that this was going to be this great surrounding cast, it's not coming true. The offensive line has been bad. No doubt about that. Worse, honestly, I think worse than they were last year for Justin Fields. I really do think that. The run game has not been nearly what it was last year. Um, I don't think the pass protection's been as good. I mean, Tevin Jenkins has struggled. Uh, uh, Darnell Wright was much better last year than he's been this year. Uh, left tackle injuries are, are, are popping up. Uh, Braxton Jones went down in this game. Um, so the offensive line's not playing well. This run game is laughable. Like, I, I think a lot of you guys thought I was overreacting when I said the DeAndre Swift signing was the most nonsensical, like, nothing burger of a signing. And I didn't understand why the Bears, like, rushed to the table to bring him in. I think people thought I was overreacting. It's like, no, he, he is not a good running back. He's good at catching screen passes and swing passes. And if you give him a perfectly well-blocked run, it might be it might turn into a really explosive play. He is not a starting running back in the NFL. They gave him three years, 24 million. They're stuck with him through next year. Like his, his deal is guaranteed basically next year. Horrible, horrible signing, especially when you see Roshan looking better in this game. Herbert hasn't played great either, but I think he's better than Swift. DeAndre Swift has 68 yards on 37 carries. You are wasting wasting plays, um, putting Caleb in worse situations by force feeding the guy that they paid. They are going to have to get over it, find a way to use Swift that you still get something out of him, and then start running the ball better. Get Roshan in there. Fantasy football players, I'm telling you, if Roshan's available, pick him up. Because if the Bears have half a brain, they will have a new starting running back this week. I like to think optimistically there because um, I thought he looked all right when they played him. But basically, they're asking Caleb Williams to save this team, which is just not fair to any rookie, right? So everybody cool it on the Caleb hate. He's not playing great. I don't think he's playing horrible. He's still making some plays. I, I think it's, it's there. It's just he's young. His third game. The Bears have a lot to figure out about themselves. And I don't think they hired the right play caller either. That's for sure. Like, can you imagine if they got Kubiak instead? Oh, by the way, also Keenan Allen's been hurt. <laughs> like, the, the, the idea this is going to be some amazing wide receiver trio, he just hasn't been there. So hopefully they get him back this week. Things can still turn around for the Bears. There's plenty of reason to be hopeful, but they've got to go out and do it, right? 
Um, on the plus side, Roma Dunze played well. That's a big deal. Like we broke him down last week where he, he wasn't getting open. He wasn't winning contested catches. He was like bad out the gate. Much, much better this week. Looked like the Roma Dunze that he was at Washington. Off vertical threat, off after the catch. He had, uh, he was two for three on contested catches. He was getting open deep. Could have had more if Caleb, Caleb hit him on that big one. But yeah, that's one encouraging thing for the Bears. And the defense continues to do their thing. So not all bad. Just got to do some soul searching a little bit. And, uh, Clean, clean some stuff up. I, I think they can get there. Okay, moving on. Let's go to the Sunday night football game. The Kansas City Chiefs visiting the Atlanta Falcons. Winning this one, 22-17. So, the Kansas City Chiefs are back to being a defensive football team. Just like they were last year. And I mean that is no disrespect to Patrick Mahomes, but let's face it. Team has the identity of this team has been Steve Spagnuolo's defense now for a, about the last twenty four games at least, um, and it's okay. It's just you know the face of this team, Patrick Mahomes, Kelsey, with with Taylor Swift and Andy Reid. It's like, well, those guys honestly. And, and I know Mahomes played great in the playoffs last year, and that's what he does, right? Again, this is no disrespect to Patrick Mahomes. But the reason the Chiefs are, have built this dynasty and are, are putting themselves in a position to be a three-peat is Deep Spagnolo and this defense and the superstar players they have on that side of the ball. Chris Jones, Trent McDuffie, Nick Bolton had a monster, monster game. I don't know if, I don't know why, like if I'm just noticing linebackers more or if we're just getting monster linebacker performances this season, but like, we talked about Blake Cashman and Fred Warner last week. Nick Bolton this week was another just like very memorable, dominant linebacker game. Awesome against the run. Kept Bijan in this run game in check. Had like four big run stops in this game that I noticed. I don't even know what the final stat, like how many stops he ended up with. It was probably more than four. Uh, and then he had a, a big pass breakup on a... On a intermediate throw that Kirk was trying to get to. I also caught him taking away a dig that Kirk was trying to work towards good cover. Like he was good in coverage in this play, just a dominant linebacker day from Nick Bolton, who kind of played hurt last year after looking like a top five linebacker in his second season. And if that guy's back in a contract year, just put it, put another guy on the, on the record or, how many dudes this Chiefs defense has. Uh, Leo Chanel doing his thing. Like, um, great, great day for the Chiefs defense. For the, for the Chiefs offense, it, it, man, it's, it's kind of boring. Like, they're fine. They have a plan. They're leaning into their strengths, which is their interior of their offensive line and Rasheed Rice. And that's really all there is to say about it. Their, their run game's pretty good, even with Carson Steele. But I do think they miss Pacheco's explosiveness. And then they're like, well, we can't really push the ball downfield because, let's face it, we, we all overreacted to Xavier Worthy's first night where he had two plays. He had a run, a jet, you know, a jet sweep with perfect blocking where he just went untouched for like 50 yards where his speed was utilized. And then he had a busted coverage touchdown down the field. Down the field. Since then, he has really done nothing, and they tried to push the ball down the field to him in this game. He got bodied up. They get him on a deep, uh, you know, post, and he's covered and doesn't pull away and then has a contested catch look, and he gets bodied at the catch point. It's like, where's the speed down the field? Like, he's not beating man coverage. And they don't have anybody else that's going to do that. I think they really miss Hollywood Brown. I think they had big plans for that. That was a big injury. And now they have to kind of go back to what they were early last year, where they just kind of lean into what they have. And right now, it's running the ball up the middle with the best interior O-line in the league and um, just getting finding ways to get Rasheed Rice the football. I mean, Rasheed Rice, the, the Debo Samuel thing is real. Like, he, he's, he's breaking out spin moves. Like, he is in his bag as a ball carrier right now. What do you have, like 12 receptions in this game? 
So they're leaning into him, running the ball, and playing defense. It's, it's fine, but... I mean, I, I hate to even say this, but is there a... And, and my power rankings obviously don't reflect that, and that's because of Patrick Mahomes, who inevitably is going to make enough plays when it matters. So that is the difference. But what, what I was getting at was, like, is there a huge difference between the Steelers and the Chiefs right now? The, the main difference is you trust that Patrick Mahomes can do some crazy shit in a pinch to win you these close games. Um, but even Mahomes isn't playing great right now. He had, he had a bunch of overthrows in this game. He had a bad interception. He, he had a bad week the week before against the Bengals. Like, I, look, I'm a huge Mahomes guy. I, I've already called him the GOAT. So... You guys know I love Mahomes, but he's not playing well right now. He really is not. Now, he's still making some plays in crunch time, like I said, but this team is not like the Bills, for example, firing on all cylinders at the moment, but it's September. Give him some time. Maybe Worthy breaks through. Um, you know, Kelsey, it, it really does feel like they're him dunking him and like, yeah, just kind of chill he, he he he's not he doesn't look athletic right now but i wonder like is he pushing himself 100 percent? it's kind of weird what's going on with kelsey but we also kind of predicted that that might happen i think they're intentionally kind of staying away from him because they just want him healthy and in, in january but for the for the time being feels like they're going to kind of just scrap their way through the the regular season and do their thing in the, in the playoffs. Again, it's very similar to last year. Um, for the Falcons, it's, it, it's been a struggle to start the year. It really has. It's it just nothing feels easy for them. And I have not been impressed by her cousins, number one. They've been fine. I don't want to pile on Kirk, but he definitely has not been what he was. Like, he has not just picked up where he left off. That's for sure. I think some of it's probably the ankle. Some of it is it's a new offense, new receivers. It, it, you know, for a pocket passing quarterback that depends on timing and rhythm, it just, it just hasn't been as simple as it was for him with Kevin O'Connell and that Vikings offense that we're seeing work wonders for Sam Darnold, right? But I also have not been impressed, really, by Zach Robinson. I'll say it. Had high expectations for him. I just don't feel like they have a great feel for what they want to do offensively right now. It's honestly kind of feels like an Arthur Smith offense again with less creative buttons being pressed. I, they came out with a good game plan out the gate. I'll give them that. They had some good man beaters. They get Mo Mooney on the crosser. They get the fake screen touchdown. They got the look they wanted. Like, that was nice, right? It's not all bad. I like that they've leaned into Bijan, like, early in the, in the year, but uh, in the first two games, but Bijan wasn't cooking in this game, and they ran out of answers as the game went on. Like, it felt like they had some nice, nice plays scripted up. They get the big Kyle Pitts touchdown as well, which beats, uh, or, or big Kyle Pitts play, which beats man coverage. But it was all early in the game, kind of predictive, scripted stuff. Didn't feel like they were able to adjust or know what they wanted to do as the game went on. And it, I mentioned it feels like an Arthur Smith offense because, like, they're just not leaning into the guys they should be leaning into. You know, Kyle Pitts still not getting enough targets. I feel like he's looking pretty good when they do use him, but they're just not using him. He had, what, four, four targets in this game? Like, that's just not enough. They gave two high leverage carries to Tyler Algier in this game. It felt like they weren't doing that in the first two weeks. All of a sudden... Big fourth down, a big third down. They're giving it to Tyler Algier. I felt like both times he got stuffed just kind of running into the back of his lineman. Like, I don't think Bijan would have done that. I think Bijan would have found the holes off to the left that were there on those plays. So that was very Arthur Smithy, not using pits, using Algier in the wrong spots. You know, Algier should be your, our run blocking's been great. We've got these guys on the run. We can, we can um, put in our enforcer to end this game. Not like we're losing, it's third and one, and we need a yard. Like, I still trust Bijan to get you a yard more than Algier. You know what I'm saying? 
And in the first three quarters, it was like not they they haven't and really the whole start to this season too, like they are not using Drake London, which is weird. They they started to use him in the fourth quarter, which helped them put themselves in a position to maybe win this game. Um but he's just he's not getting his targets, and I don't think Kirk is really trusting him to the level that he should be trusting him. There was a third down I saw. I don't even remember what Kirk ended up doing on the play, but I um, do vividly remember Drake London was running a corner route. He had some separation. Would have been a great time to throw a corner route to Drake London, pretty much in the same spot that it felt like those third down corner routes to Justin Jefferson were like automatic in Minnesota. So I'm surprised that like those throws have not been there. London is really freaking good, man. It's just, they're not using him. So just haven't been impressed by the offensive construction and execution. And then defensively, they've been impressive. They, I still don't love their D-line, right? It's just going to be tough for them to be a shutdown defense when they just don't have the dudes. They have some guys, but they're just not going to be a beer factor pass rush or anything like that. But the secondary is absolutely legit. This safety duo had a great game. Um, they have kept, they've kept them in games, played great run defense. That has carried over. Uh, so... You know, I think Raheem Morris has been pretty solid, but I also don't think Raheem Morris adjusted well to kind of collapse on the Chiefs. I feel like the Chiefs have put themselves in a spot where they can kind of suffocate, like get suffocated a little bit by themselves because it's like they, they're either running the ball up the middle or throwing a bubble screen to Rasheed Rice, but they don't really have the ability to open up the field. I felt like they kind of stayed off, allowed all these underneath throws, got ran on a little bit, like... It wasn't a horrible day for the defense, but I, I think you could have seen a little bit more from Raheem, uh, from Raheem Morris, too. So, I don't know, man. They're just a very average football team. They're, like, kind of fine on both sides of the ball. You know, Kirk's not playing horrible. They do have playmakers. Again, they're not horrible defensively, but they're just not a dynamic team at all right now. So, we'll see if that We'll see if they're able to find some answers as the year goes on. Okay, Philadelphia at New Orleans. Philly screams back to win this one after what was really an ugly day for the Eagles offense, honestly. I'm going to get to that, but, you know, this game was won in, in three, three phases. The Eagles defense stepped it up. Vic Fangio, these guys called into question, were scrutinized all week long. They stepped up. They stopped the run against a Saints team that has been bullying teams on the ground Jalen Carter there he is there he is and boy was he there I know that was not worded well but watching this game it was like oh yeah that dude's got it he was all over the field he had a bunch of run stops was great against the run getting off blocks and had four impactful pressures in this game just a absolute dominant impact performance from Jalen Carter he even had a uh, pass deflection too, like working his way to the quarterback, batted a ball down. Like he was just a dominant, a dominant performance from him. Um, and then the linebackers, this was the first time this year that both N'Kobe Dean and Zach Bond played well. Felt like they traded turns. Bond played great week one, and then it flipped week two, but they had a complete performance together. Man, this is the result of if the Eagles defense is complete. I mean, their secondary played well. You had um, uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson making plays. Reed Blankenship continues to look good. Quinion Mitchell should have had a pick six in this game. Uh, Darius Slay was fine. Like, their defense is complete, and Vic Fangio's got these guys working. Like, this unit can really come together. Uh, just one week, though. We'll see if that continues. But offensively, I mean... Two superstar players bailed them out. You had Dallas Goddard came all the way back in this game. He, he had a rough year last year, if you remember, but he still has it, man. He, he was dominant in this game. Run after catch, separating to all three levels of the field. Uh, big, big day for Dallas Goddard. And then Saquon. Saquon in the second half of this game just kind of took over multiple big runs, including the 60 yard touchdown run. Obviously they wouldn't win this game without that and his speed. So they, they got just enough plays from 
really the two superstar playmakers they had left in this game. You got to remember they came into this game without AJ Brown. And I would love to see the on off splits with Jalen Hurts with and without AJ Brown. I, I could probably look that up, but uh, Devonta Smith goes down after getting drilled in the head. Uh, very dirty play, by the way, by Peyton Turner in this game to go after him when he was already lying on the ground with his helmet off. He tried to spear him. Hope they suspend him for that because they missed it. But, you know, the Eagles got dudes, and the dudes stepped up for the offense. But I will say it. I've kind of shied away from it first couple weeks, I'm waiting to see how this goes with the new offense, but I'm ready to say it. Dylan Hurts does not look good. He's not looked good this year. Uh, the, the first night was super ugly. He was fine, I, I, I think, week two. But this game was, like, super underwhelming from him. Where do you even want to start? Number one for me, his pocket presence. I try not to dwell on this, like, every week. But I think you guys know I've made this point about Jalen Hurts. Like, his pocket presence is so bad. Like, he might have bottom three pocket feel of starters in the league. Like he just is completely oblivious to where the rush is coming from. He does not have the feel for that space inside the pocket to know how to utilize and deploy his legs in the right times. His, his feel for when and how to use his feet is brutally inconsistent and pocket presence. At least the way I talk about it is just like accuracy where just because one time he did stay in a clean pocket and made a dime of a throw, or one time he did get out of a sack and made a good play on the run. That does not mean the consistency is there. And, and that's just the, the biggest way to summarize my frustration with Hurts. Like, there's he is the ugly interception in this game where he kind of forces it. And to be fair, Devonta Smith should have ran his route under the safety. Hurts was hoping he would, and he kind of let it go. Safety jumped it, but he forced it, right? It's equally on him as it is on Smith, I think, to force that throw when it just wasn't there. Um, but he forces it from, it's not like he's under pressure, right? He has a perfectly clean pocket down in the red zone. Like, they're driving. They need points in this game. And, like, you have a, you have a clean, he has, on this play, go back and watch it, he has a clean escape lane to the left. Like, dude, you are Jalen Hurts. You can run it in. You break tackles. You can throw on the run. Dudes can get open. Like, don't force the garbage look from a clean pocket down in the red zone. Go do something with your feet. He gets strip sack fumbled, trying to roll out left, not feeling that rush. He just is oblivious to the guy chasing him. He gets strip sack fumbled. Blatant display of bad pocket presence. He has a play before half when they're driving where he has perfect pass protection. There's no pressure. There's like 30 seconds left. They're trying to drive. They're on like the 50, maybe 45 yard line. And he just throws it out of bounds from a perfectly clean pocket. And it's like, you're not utilizing the most of every play. You, you have an opportunity to navigate the pocket. You could look for an escape lane. Scramble, do something other than just wasting a perfectly good, not a perfectly good play because no one's open. But for all intents and purposes, like that's a, a perfectly. Um, how, how can I word this? It's not a perfect play. You're not wasting a perfect play, but you're wasting a perfectly good play. Pardon the lack of better terms there. Um, but there could have been something there is what I'm saying. But it's also it's not just the pocket presence either like there's a big third down in this game where the saints showed a simulated blitz they walked everybody up the line draw ended up only rushing four overloading one side um and dropping seven into coverage and jalen just didn't have the answer for it uh, i know they're working on that uh having him provide more answers to the blitz but he didn't on that play um you know he ends up just kind of immediately chucking the ball short of the sticks <laughs> against the simulated pressure look. It's like, well, you, you got to have better answers than that when that's been a weakness on you throughout the years. He also had like an ugly missed opportunity 
on just what felt like a predetermined first down throw. It felt like he walked up to the line. He's like, all right, outside corners playing off. I'm just going to throw the quick out. We'll get to second and six and get to the next play. But like right in his field of vision, it's just probably a smash concept where you have the, the speed out and a corner over the top. And again, I'd have to watch the all 22, but the corner to Dallas Goddard comes wide open. Probably a touchdown if it's a well-thrown pass. And Hurts just quickly takes the out route, um, gets broken up or, or tackled for like a two-yard gain. It's like, well, it's just you're predetermining your reads. You're not playing comfortably uh, from a processing point of view within the, the structure of, of this new offense. And honestly, like his two biggest plays in this game, I, I, don't, I don't even think you can really make the point this week of like, well, he made enough plays in the end when it mattered. Cause the last two weeks he has, um, this week, not really. I mean, okay. He throws a crossing route to Dallas Goddard on a busted coverage from the saints. Like, sure. He, he saw a wide open crossing route where he throws it four yards and then Dallas Goddard outruns the defense for 50 yards. Like, we really given Jalen Hurts that much credit for that. He also had, you know, his other best play in this game. Um, other than one nice scramble, he had one nice scramble in there. But again, he's not doing that enough. Um, there's a play early in the game where they get a big completion. It was a play action shot play, uh, kind of a play action throwback where Dallas Goddard kind of fakes the corner and then breaks on a post. And he's wide open, and Jalen Hurts honestly kind of underthrows him. He throws it behind him. Goddard has to kind of work back. If he leads him, it might have been a touchdown. But like even the best plays from Hurts were like didn't really do anything on those plays. So I was just so so underwhelmed by Hurts. And honestly, it it kind of feels like he's trying to be Dak, and they're asking him to be Dak. In this, you know, this is Dak Prescott's offense, right? Kellen Moore coming over. He's not. He's not Dak Prescott. I don't think he has the, the processing. He certainly doesn't have the pre-snap processing or post-snap. You know, Dak, like, Dak legitimately plays like Peyton Manning, and for the most part, he's really freaking good at it. One of the best surgical processing and decision-making quarterbacks in the league. That's not Hurts. That's not Hurts. Hurts is, a, in many, many ways, a first read and then react type of quarterback. And right now, not using his legs, he's making mistakes in structure. He doesn't have really the, the accuracy and the arm talent of Dak Prescott. And it's just, it just has not been pretty. I'll leave it there. It's been addressed. He's got to play better. I think he can play better. It's week three of this offense in a game where they're in New Orleans without A.J. Brown, without Devontae Smith. I will acknowledge that and that this can get better, but it's got to get better. They're not going to go anywhere if he doesn't start playing better. I do feel that way. Um, and after really watching this game back, I kind of regret putting the Eagles three in the rankings. But at the same time, they could get A.J. Brown back this week, and I think he's a monumental impact for the offense. So, and the defense played great. So there were good things this week, but I don't know, man. want to see more from Hurts. Let's talk Saints. Um, obviously a disappointing week if you're a Saints fan because the fun thing of this team season was the offense was a juggernaut. They come to a screeching, screeching halt. Derek Carr looks super mid again. I would, I would even wager to go in on Derek Carr in this one and say he played poorly. I mean, he made some throws to Chris Olave in this game. I'll give him those, but... Man, like if Carr was just a little bit better, they win this game. I mean, they have. I have four four notes on plays that Carr was not good. He he underthrows Rashid uh, Rashid Shahid on a uh, Rashid Shahid on a deep ball this week. Didn't look underthrown until you watch it back and notice that Shahid had to slow down and invite Quinion Mitchell back into the play where he could break it up. Um. He should have had a pick six in the third quarter to Quinion Mitchell, who jumps an out route. Uh, he got lucky on that. Mitchell just misplayed it. Kind of interesting. Mitchell kind of 
the ball hits him in his chest, but he swats the ball when it's like right here. It's like, dude, you read it perfectly. You jumped it. Grab it, <laughs> you know? Uh, so maybe a learning moment there for the rookie. He had a, you know, he, right after he throws a couple nice balls to Olave to take a touchdown lead in this game, which again, you give him credit for those throws, but they go for two to make it a seven point game. And it's just classic Derek Carr red zone play where the ball's snapped and it's like an instant throw to the flat to the running back from a clean pocket. And it's just such a vintage Derek Carr. I mean, talk about bad, bad pocket presence. There's no ability to feel like, okay, it's a big play in this game. There's no ability to feel like, okay, maybe the throw to the flat two yards short of the conversion, the two point conversion from a clean pocket to a contested check down is not the best option here. Let's look at the rush. Let's feel this thing out. Can I scramble it in? Is there another receiver on the play? Is there a better high percentage look on this critical play? It was just such a garbage look from Derek Carr. And it ended up being a, a big play because it was 12 to seven at that point. So had they gotten it, it's a touchdown lead for the Eagles. Um, who turn around and get a touchdown, they end up going for two to make it a touchdown lead on their end or a, a field goal lead on their end. Uh, but had they uh, gotten that two-point conversion, you're probably talking about overtime as opposed to Saints get the ball back and Derek Carr throws just a completely unnecessary, ugly-ass interception. The pressure gets in on second and five, and instead of Derek Carr dirting it having the athleticism to extend the play. He just chucks it up and it gets picked off and the game's over. It's like, all right, welcome back, Derek Carr. We, we missed you. Saints fans didn't. Um, but that's obviously, a, you know, just not what the Saints want. But two things. Number one, they were out probably the two most, well, two of the most critical parts of this offense under Kubiak. Their center, Eric McCoy, who's damn good integral part of their run game um, they end up having to put um uh, patrick at center and then their left guard spot gets worse so they're worse at two positions because of that basically um and then Taysom hill i think Taysom hill is kind of the core of the play calling side of things for kubiak he's kind of the linchpin that he moves around and kind of use his uses him to set stuff up and keep the rhythm of things um, the way that they use him and, and just to have his running ability is huge. So they were missing those two guys. McCoy's going to miss him an extended period of time. I didn't even realize Hill was out in this game, so I don't know his status, but um, those count for sure. And then uh, the defense continue to play great. Like that's a thumbs up for the Saints. Like Dennis Allen and this defense need to get credit. Like they continue to fly around and just take the fight to the other team. I, I just love their style. They're so good at it. Tyron Matthew, all these corners, like just, I, I love this defense and they, they played really well in this game. Good enough to win for sure. So it's not all bad, but obviously a discouraging week after how their season started. All right. We are starting to get into more of the, Shorter analysis, so probably won't be spending as much time on these upcoming games. But we got Green Bay at Tennessee. Again, the main takeaway here is like just how massive this is for Green Bay to get two wins without Jordan Love. You're two and one. You host the Vikings. Jordan Love returning. Like this team season felt like it was just going to be over before it got started, before they ever played a game in America. And now they're not just back. They're like. They're ready to like take the reins. I mean, the Niners are injury depleted. Um, you know, Dallas is in shambles. Like the Vikings are looking like one of their bigger threats in the NFC. Like just such a big deal for the Packers there. But want to credit Malik Willis for how just how damn good he looked in these two games. A complete evolution from him. Tennessee watching this game on the other sideline. Must have just been like, what? Where the hell did this guy come from? Because this is not the Malik Willis that played in Nashville. 
And uh, the Packers are really good at this quarterback development thing. And somehow in three weeks, they turn Malik Willis into what looks like a very competent backup. And it's not just, all right, he ran a bunch of play action, first read boots, and they got him going on read options. It was more than that this week. I mean, week one, that's kind of what it was, or, or the first game against the Colts. This week, like, he actually made some big, like, high leverage throws on third down. Like, when he's making those, it's like, this is, this is over <laughs> for the Titans. They couldn't keep up with it when they're converting. You know, they would get the Packers in a spot where they wanted them. And then Willis is just, like, stepping up in the pocket, hitting the intermediate dig on, like, big throws. Um, so, just a huge credit to him. Was great as a runner in this game, too. Did more as a runner in this game than he did against the Colts. So big for the Packers to have like a good backup too. It's always nice to have. If it's a game like this where your your starter's kind of questionable, you don't want to risk a bigger injury. Uh, you know, you feel like you have a chance to win a game with a guy like this, and they won two. Uh, it's huge credit to Matt Lafleur as well. Obviously, his play calling is just absurd. For all the credit we gave Malik Willis, like Lafleur did find a lot of easy buttons for him. I want to shout out, by the way, the throwback. This is a, a complete divergent uh, conversation here, but um, the throwback screen is in. And we, I, we, I think I saw like eight or nine of these this week, but it's something I've observed over the years with, all, with the breakout of the wide zone offenses is... Teams will run these like play action boots where they fake the, they, it's a hard fake to the left. It's play action naked, right? So you're running wide zone fake. The line carries out the fake. The running back carries out the fake. And then the play action, you know, the quarterback boots back to the other side. And what I had noticed on film all the time, and I'm sure coordinators have now noticed this, and it's certainly spreading throughout the league, but it's like, the entire defense is so worried about the play action side of things after the run fake that they just entirely disregard this running back sitting over there with a convoy that really oftentimes just has to block like a slot corner or a linebacker that is maybe paying respect to it. And we've seen that this year, these play action throwbacks, um, lethal absolutely lethal and just present a whole nother frustration for these defenses trying to deal with play actions right now. And, and the Packers ran one of those. It wasn't exactly as I described. It was more of a counter reverse action with a throwback element to it, but similar idea where the defense is so distracted by the run fake pass fake, that they're not really worried about, the initial guy that got the play fake being the guy that is actually where the ball is going. Um, and Emmanuel Wilson ends up having a huge touchdown on that. Um, so they're, they're creating these explosive plays off of offensive genius. Um, even the first play out the gate, they just run a fake toss to the right. And it's just a play action toss throwback where, where Jaden Reed breaks open on the crossing route. Just perfect scheming from Matt LaFleur. And then the defense stepping up too. the defense discovering that confidence that they can win a pair of games with them on that side of the ball. The D line was nasty in this game. Um, so just everything clicking for green Bay full speed ahead. Now heading into what in many ways is their week one, honestly, because they had the weird Brazil game and then, you know, game, all these games mattered, but like how much do you take away from them without Jordan love? I mean, Certainly something, defense and Matt LaFleur, and they have a backup quarterback now, but uh, in many ways, they can like mentally start their season here, week four. Tennessee is running in circles right now. Very worried about the kind of just overall direction. It's just kind of hard to see where this is going at the moment. Not that they can't figure it out as the year goes on, but it's just kind of hard to sort through mentally right now. I mean, Will Levis, another horrible day. Zero big-time throws. Three turnover-worthy plays in this game. One just horrid interception. Jair's just sitting on an out route. Jumps it, pick six. Kind of felt like the game was over after that. It just can't happen. Which we've said that about a bunch of turnovers for him 
this year. So you're not seeing him limit the mistakes, which it's just at some point there's there's got to be a hard cutoff on that where it's like, you know, this is what Levis was last year. It's what he's doing this year. At a certain point, it's like, can he just not help himself but make big mistakes? So that's running in circles right now. And then just like these offensive line problems persist. They thought they were fixing it getting Callahan in here. And I still have a lot of faith in Callahan and, and hopefully in time he can work with these guys, but man, it's like the last thing you expected with Callahan coming in was that Peter Skaronsky and, and uh, Lloyd Cushenberry were going to struggle, but they're struggling. And then the right side of the line that we figured was going to struggle is struggling. At least JC Latham seems to have figured it out. That's good. Um, though he was ugly week one. But it's a, it's a disgusting combination of bad O-line play and Will Levis spiraling right now. And I, I don't, I'm not really seeing anything from Brian Callahan that's like going to dig them out of this right now. And then defensively, they're fine. Like they got a bunch of vets. I, I'm not seeing anything really special from them on that side of the ball. They're fine but I don't really see the like vision there either. There's not like a bunch of young players. I'm super excited about. I mean, you got Simmons and sweat on duo. McCreary's a good slot corner. Kind of it. Um, fun linebacker room, but I don't know, man. They, they definitely feel like they are spiraling into a evaluation losing season and might be looking for a new quarterback this off season. Let's go ahead and move forward to the Chargers Steelers game. Really was exactly what you expected for the first two and a half quarters of this game. Kind of a grudge match, a lot of running, short passes, defense, exactly as we kind of expected to play out. But as the game went on, the Chargers injuries just caught up with them. You have. Rashawn Slater goes down in this game. Justin Herbert has to come out because he was questionable before the game started. He's dealing with an ankle sprain. He re-aggravates it, has to come out. You've got, I mean, they just didn't have a chance at that point because DeWalt then goes, goes down, I think, later in this game. It, 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 the, the wheels just fell off. You know, they were on a journey. They were competitive. Lad McConkey doing things. They get Quentin Johnston schemed open for an open touchdown. Love to see that again. Um, things were kind of working until they weren't. So I'm not, not worried about the Chargers. It's more just like they got to get healthy. They were in a position to kind of prove that they can go and beat a like-minded, scrappy Steelers team until they weren't. Um, as for the Steelers, this defense is sensational. Uh, this defensive line is as advertised and some. I mean, why did the league let them get Nick Herbig? Why? It, he was so clearly another one of these dudes. So Alex Highsmithy as a, as a prospect. Monster day. Three pressures, two sacks. He really is just another one of these dudes. Like, obviously, Watt's better than Highsmith, and Highsmith is more proven than Herbig. But for them to be able to rotate these guys now and feel good about kind of getting the same type of impact, really, I mean... I'm not trying to say it as a disrespect to TJ Watt. It's more of just like these other guys are really freaking good. And obviously TJ Watt's better, but you can give TJ Watt a little bit of a breather and still get a really good edge rush. And Cam Hayward looks back again, like really good game. They're still not playing Keanu Benton as much as they probably could, which is kind of scary, but he's been disruptive every week. It feels like, his D-line is nasty. Porter's really good on the back end. This is a really good defense. And then on the offensive side of the ball, Fields was stable. Again, it felt like they put a little bit more on his plate in terms of passing more. Uh, he ended up 25 of 32, just, you know, really avoided mistakes. The interception was not his fault. It wasn't the prettiest non-turnover-worthy play, if you will. You know, some... Some of these interceptions are ruled not a turnover-worthy play, right, by PFF. Sometimes it's like, okay, 
he threw an open slant and the re- it bounced off the receiver's hands and it landed in the safety's lap, right? Like that is just so obviously not the quarterback's fault. This was closer to like the Aaron Rodgers interception week one where it's like, well, he's throwing a contested pass with leverage away from the defender and it just got an unlucky bounce. So it's like, it wasn't necessarily like a great throw, but you definitely don't expect it to get intercepted. It ends up bouncing off the defender's kneecap, popped up in the air and intercepted. So he ends up with an interception this game that was not a turnover worthy play, which I agree with. Um, overall though, like trusting him more to like, just drop back more ends up completing 25 out of 32 passes actually like going through his progressions. Like you're seeing some mental growth there. Uh, not staring down that first read as much, just operating a little bit faster. And it's like, they're kind of like toying with what they can put on his plate. And I'm just, I continue to be very interested in this Justin Fields salvage product here, uh, a project here in, in Pittsburgh. So good to see that. Great to see as well. Alvin Austin emerging here Four receptions for 94 yards has the big catch and run touchdown. I love Calvin Austin coming out. I actually compared him to Brandon cooks and just hasn't been in a, he hasn't been healthy and he hasn't been in a situation conducive to his success with how garbage their quarterback play has been. Um, but even this, even this big touchdown he had, it wasn't like some crazy throw from fields. He throws an inbreaker and Austin takes it to the house, shows off his speed, his catch and run ability. He's a really explosive player. Uh, so, I mean, that's something they need is a, not just a number two option other than George Pickens, but they need some dynamism. And he's a guy like, okay, if Fields is really starting to get more comfortable, they've got this kind of game plan. I mean, having, having a two-way go for Fields on some of these play-action shot plays where you've got the speedy Austin where it's like, all right, if he's got a half a step, lead him, let him ride, or chuck it up to George Pickens. Like that's a, that's a real thing that they could tap into. They haven't done that specific thing yet, but uh, look out for that. I just think Austin has some talent. And then Zach Frazier as well. Great to see that they had a big kind of center competition question mark in the preseason. They weren't even sure if Frazier was going to win that job. And then he kind of pulled through at the end and took that center job. And, uh, you know, this is very much a draft miss from me. I can't really explain it. It just, my eyes, I think, betrayed me on this one with Zach Frazier. He was a guy that got a lot of hype. Everybody kind of loved him. Wrestling background. I felt like that narrative got kind of overdeployed. Clearly it mattered. <laughs> Yet again, the wrestling background applies to a center being good. Um, probably the last time I doubt that that's going to translate. Um, and it was the only time that I doubted it really, but, um, I don't know. I just didn't love his tape straight up. Like I didn't think he was that athletic. I thought he fell off blocks. I thought he got beat as a pass blocker and you know, there's still time. They haven't really gotten into a lot of drop back situations against good interior rushes. I will say that the first two weeks, they just didn't drop back a lot. It was just a lot of running and play action boots and stuff. Um, and then this week, they did drop back more, but it was more quick game and against the Chargers interior D-line, which is abysmal. So there's still time for some pass blocking deficiencies to show up, but he's been an excellent run blocker. He looks very good. Certainly does not look like a bad player. And uh, not that I thought he'd be a bad player, but he's been much better than the floor that I thought he would have. Anyway, I liked, I, I'm, I'm cool with Zach Frazier. Like, I, I've, I'm totally happy to see him playing well. Uh, I think he's a fun player. I just, my eyes didn't like what they saw in that one. So I'll take the L on Zach Frazier. I will. Uh, Great to see for the Steelers, of course, after they invested in that O-line. And they, you know, they've got some tackle problems right now. So it's good, good for them to have something working for them there. Um, yeah, I think that's all we got. I, I don't really have too much to say on the chargers. I think we already hit on that. Uh, They got to get healthy. So we got Denver at Tampa Bay. This was actually a very enjoyable game to watch. Not if you're a Bucks fan, but um, I was just happy for Denver. They've had such a rough first couple weeks. This was just a kind of a, I mean, it was, it was a blowout. They throttled the Tampa Bay Bucks, who were one of the storylines of the first two weeks of the season. 
on both sides of the ball. They, they just looked phenomenal. And Bo Nix looked, well, I, I would say they looked good on offense and looked phenomenal on defense. But this was the Bo Nix that, this was Auburn, uh, not Auburn Bo Nix. Auburn Bo Nix was the first two weeks. Uh, this was Oregon Bo Nix in this game. This was so much closer to what I liked about Bo Nix what you thought you'd see from him in a Sean Payton offense just looked like a vet, right? On time, accurate, 70% completion percentage in this game. Ended up making some big throws too. Not like monster throws, but was credited with two big time throws. Uh, Just, you know, enough accuracy and arm talent down the field to get some explosive plays in there. Uh, And then also one thing you loved about him at Oregon was he was very... Brock Purdy esque in this in the uh, sack avoidance category. He took zero sacks in this game, and he has that feel for like, hey, play's dead. We got to go. We got to get out of this. We got to make something happen. Very much did that in this in this game, and he did it without making those stupid mistakes out of structure like he did in the first two weeks. So really encouraging to kind of reinforce what you thought you were getting in Bo Nix. Now it's like. Is this who he is, or are we going to see more of week one, week two, Bo Nix show back up? But definitely encouraging to see that. Did have one turnover where they play, made a bad read and forced it, so it wasn't entirely um, mistake-proof for Bo Nix, but you'll definitely take one bad read that, that wasn't also like... um egregious like the Seahawks game where he's chucking it into triple coverage or just not seeing a linebacker. It was just a bad read um, forced to throw that, that he shouldn't have, but um, got away with it. Good, good game for Bo Nix. Ultimately though, everybody loves to start with the rookie quarterback analysis. And I, I did for a reason, but honestly the story of this game for Denver and, and really on their season to this point is how good their defense actually has been. I've quietly been impressed with them and Vance Joseph's uh, scheming of this group for the first couple of weeks. Uh, but I mean, they, I, I mean, I can't st- say they stole the show cause all eyes are on Bo Nix, but they, they really were the story of this game uh, and, and dominated on the defensive side of the ball. And it was in, in, on both parts of the defense, the D line got after it. They had 29 pressures, seven sacks in this game. Bunch of dudes coming from everywhere. John Franklin Myers, Nick Benito, um, Vance Joseph blitzed the fifth most out of any team in the league this week. So they were just flying after it, getting after Baker. But some very creative stuff in this game, too, that I'll get to in a second. Um, But I want to credit the secondary as well. Really good in this game. Pat Sertan put Mike Evans in a little corner, locked him away. Said, See See you later, Mike. You can go pick on someone next week, but not me. He has to wear them away. Uh, but not just him. Like, Riley Moss, big week for him and all the white cornerbacks out there. Kind of a breakout game for him. Had a great, great day. Uh, Chris Godwin had a, had a really nice fade touchdown in this game, but, you know, if he was going to have to be the number two option... Uh, There's a lot of plays where he was covered up down the field by Riley Moss. And then even like um, the safeties played really well. Brandon Jones had two interceptions. He's probably been a little better than I expected. Bringing him, they gave him way more than I expected. I thought he was pretty bad in Miami. Um, But playing a little bit more free safety here, he's pretty good back there. And then um, Jaquan McMillian, the slot corner, wasn't perfect they tried to pick on him and that was where godwin got a decent amount of work uh, from the slot there but mcmillan uh did kind of keep everything in front of him he he was targeted 10 times gave up eight receptions it's so hard as a slot corner right but just 57 yards on those eight receptions the longest play was 13 yards like had a couple missed tackles but for the most part was was top down with his coverage Rated out all right. All, all over. This defense stepped up. And I, I want to kind of use the transition. I mentioned Vance Joseph did some really creative stuff. I want to use that as a transition to ding on, to, to bang on Baker Mayfield in this game. So Baker was horrible in this game. And 
Vance Joseph did a did a thing a couple times in this game where no no hard to know how to structure this, but basically Baker was throwing the ball short of the sticks. He was not extending plays. He kind of looked like what Baker looked like a couple years ago, where his pocket presence was kind of shoddy. He wasn't very confident. He was like drifting into pressure. You know, he's kind of gotten away from that, especially in the first two weeks. Like week one and two, Baker was nowhere to be found in this game. But later in this game, I think Vance Joseph noticed that, that Baker's like playing this thing safe. He's not looking comfortable back there. We've kind of got him flustered with all the blitzing. So two times in the second half, he shows blitz and drops everybody into coverage. Not like Brian Flores dropping eight into coverage. Like he literally did not rush him on one play. And then the other play, everybody drops and then three guys rushed. But obviously, you know, no pass rush. And these aren't like Hail Mary situations. These are like, it's like a third and 10, a third and 20. I think one of them was. But, like, Baker literally could have just sat in the pocket, waited for something. Like, it's a bold strategy to just not rush the passer. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But Baker didn't even sit and wait to see what would develop down the field. Both times uh, uh, Vance Joseph did this, Baker got rid of the ball immediately. Yeah, that's a yikes. That's a big, big yikes. And I'm curious to see if that happens again, but um, Baker just looked uncomfortable, flustered, timid all game long. He had an ugly interception early. Multiple drives ended with him just throwing the ball short of the sticks. Like that just hasn't been him in the first couple of weeks. He's been extending plays. He's looked elite. No, no, he, he looked like the, you know, guy that we were talking about as a bust in this game. So that's obviously something to monitor is what version of Baker do we get moving forward? Um, really, the, you know, the Bucks overall were just super flat, though. Um, we, I, a mini, a mini kind of pat on the back for my Patreon picks. I did call this a potential trap game for Tampa after having to go to Detroit and winning that game. Kind of just coming home, an 0-2 Broncos team, desperate for a win, whereas you're kind of coasting. And also, like, not just the team was flat, but the fans, the stadium, no energy. It just screamed trap game from the very beginning, and the Broncos capitalized on it. The, the only good takeaway for the Bucks is that Bucky Irving is sweet. Um you know, shifty jitterbug type of running back who I, I just wasn't sure how his game was going to translate. Cause he's slow and really undersized. I loved his game obviously, but it's like, are you going to be able to make guys miss like that in the NFL? So I kind of played it down the middle. I, I didn't love Bucky. People were definitely higher on Bucky than me I didn't hate Bucky. I was just kind of curious to see where this was going to go, but I, I really enjoyed watching him in this game. He absolutely has the shiftiness to make guys miss. I don't know if he's quite going to do it like he did it at Auburn against Pac-12 defenders, but definitely can make guys miss. What did he, what did he end up having in this game? I should pull that up real quick. How many uh, missed tackles forced he had? I'm going to take a second because i got to look at the receiving as well. Um, so here we go. We got six, six, more, uh, six missed tackles forced on nine rushing attempts. And then I bet he had some in the, on the air too. He had three catches, two missed tackles forced on three receptions. So maybe he is going to be able to force missed tackles like he did at Oregon. That is eight missed tackles forced on 12 touches. Did I add that up right on my, in my mind there? But it showed. It was really fun to watch. Um, I mentioned the Bucks crowd was nowhere to be found. The only time I heard Bucks fans in this game was not cheering for a third down stop. It was chanting Bucky <laughs> when he would make guys miss. And he looks to me a little bit thicker than he did at Oregon. I don't know if there's been any, any news about them, about, uh, about that, about him bulking up. Um, but looks a little bit more like Kyron Williams size uh, as opposed to he played at like 190 at Oregon. So 
uh, that would be a big deal. If he's got a little bit more size, a little more contact balance, which that showed, like he was taking hits and, and um, kind of n- not running with power, but contact balance. And that's, that would definitely be a big deal for him to be a success. And yeah, they, they kind of started to use him um, as a weapon in this game. They, they ran the Devon Achan Bucks. Um, we call it the Buck sweep, I guess, with Bucky on the Bucks. But um, the jet sweep reverse thing where they kind of fake power and then subtly kind of toss it to the running back who was lined up as like a wing tight end. Um, I think a lot of you guys know what play I'm talking about. Um, but just kind of getting him out in space with some lead blockers and... He doesn't have the speed of HN, but he does have that kind of shifty ability. So it it was fun to see how they were kind of using him. And it was also fun to see after the Bucky chance, Rashad White comes in. Rashad White, remember, I am very low on what he is as a running back. He's a great receiving back, but, you know, he had a thousand rushing yards last year and everyone's like, oh, he's good. And I'm like, well, he had like 300 carries. (laughs) His efficiency is horrible. And they've been searching for a run game. So anyway... Um, Rashad White had his best run of the game right after fans started chanting Bucky and he's like oh no you don't rookie <laughs> Like, I'm still here it'll be an interesting competition to see play out because I definitely think Bucky is more impressive than Rashad White so we'll see that uh, play out in time here I think we might be seeing a new starting running back developing in, in Tampa but let's move on Next up, we have the Carolina Panthers dreading the Raiders. I just don't have a lot of notes on this game because what what all is there to say? I mean, Andy Dalton was sick. He was legit good. Like, okay, he comes out, gets the opening drive, uh, touchdown, throws a touchdown in the flat to Chuba Hubbard after making some nice throws. Um, It's like, Funny, right? Like, oh my God, they would score a touchdown on their first drive without Bryce Young. Like, of course. But then as the game goes on, you're watching this and you're like, eh, he's dealing, bro. Like, he, he had four really impressive throws that I, no- I noted in this game and, and was just methodical all day long. But he's got a really nice touch pass up the seam to Tommy Tremble where he kind of floats it over the linebacker, throws it underneath the safety. But then... Even more so, he throws, he rips a deep dig on third and long in between zone defenders. Like, all right, like Bryce isn't making that throw. And then the, the best throw of the day was where he's falling back under pressure and just drops a dime over the top of two red zone defenders uh, into, was it Deontay Johnson on the play? I think it was. But just an over-the-shoulder, beautiful throw from Dalton. And then the touchdown throw before half to Adam Thielen, too, where he splits the zone up the seam. Like, he, he was shredding, man. 36 years old. You got to give him credit. I feel like a lot of backups, when they lose that starting job, I don't want to say they check out, but... They'll come in and, and not necessarily look as prepared, as ready to go. Um, talking about these guys that were starters that became backups. You know, maybe Joe Flacco, um, maybe Nick Foles a little bit, Teddy Bridgewater, Jameis. Like, this, this really felt like Dalton has been preparing to be the starter of this team for a long time. Like he, he was in complete command. You just don't, even guys that have been starters in the past, you just don't typically see that when they first step in. So it was just a really applaudable effort from Dalton uh, mentally and physically. Like he's legit making throws out here that are super impressive. And you remember when he played one game last year, it was against at the time, a very bad Seahawks defense, but he shredded then. So th- this actually becomes very interesting. Like, is he actually good? Because let's just say not only, not only was he taking the last year to prepare like he was a starter, but let's say he actually 
And you remember, he's bounced around some really bad spots. He had a good, he had a good run in New Orleans, actually, kind of the last time he was starting. And then they replaced him with Derek Carr. And you guys laughed at me when I said uh, they would have been better bringing Dalton back for $10 million instead of giving Derek Carr. Like, look, for all my bad rookie quarterback takes, at least give me some credit for that. Like, you're telling me, Saints fans, you wouldn't flip this in a heartbeat and have Andy Dalton on this two-year, $20 million contract over Derek Carr? Like, I know he had a good first couple of weeks, but come on, you, you can't tell me you wouldn't rather have Dalton there. Um, so he actually played well in that spot. But, you know, he was, in, he was in a really tough spot in Dallas when their O-line was horrible. That was before CD really broke out. Those were kind of the bad Dallas teams when Dalton had to step in there. He had to step in for the bad Bears teams. Like, he's, he's been in some bad spots. But anyway, what I'm getting at is, it, you know, when he... <laughs> Sorry, I got to rewind a second, because even when he got benched in Cincinnati, it was like season's over, kind of a tank do- job to just put in Ryan Finley and see what he had. It's not like Dalton was playing horrible. It's just like clearly they were gearing up to draft Joe Burrow and it was time to move on. So they benched him. What I'm trying to get at here is let's just say he's actually taken the last five years as he's bounced around to legitimately develop and he's actually like really mentally sharp and he's seeing the field at an elite level. Like he could have a little 36 year old renaissance here. He hits free agency in the off season. Would he get a contract extension with the, the Panthers here? Like this could actually be really fun. And if he plays like this, the Panthers will be in games because you started to see all the moves they made. Like, they were good moves. I like the moves they made, right? The O-line has actually been... Uh, James Foster just tweeted this out before I went live, but he, he showed like the basically pressure rates for tackles versus interior offensive line. The Panthers were in the absolute best quadrant. They were at the top of the top. Like Their pass protection has arguably been the best in the league based on pressures allowed. Um, so like the O-line movement, uh, the O-line moves are working. Uh, you haven't felt like Icky has been this disaster. I actually haven't even thought about Icky this year, to be honest. There's been enough to think about with the Panthers. Um, but what's like, what is, what is Icky's uh, PFF grade this year? Well, he had a 76 in this game. He's, you know, 63 pass block rate, 65 pass block rate on the year. Just a quick look at that. He does have four penalties. But, uh, Man, if he's playing better, that's huge. But anyway, like, Deontay Johnson was huge in this game. The run game was really good. The O-line, like, Panthers can be competitive. I don't want to gas this up too much. It was the Raiders who had an awful day. But just really fun to see this. Um, The Panthers' defense did step up. Not really any specific player that I want to shout out here, but they did bring it. Um, They weren't shut down or anything. I'm, I'm obviously worried about them on that side of the ball. Um, but I want to give them credit. Averro had those guys flying around. Let's talk a little bit about the Raiders if we have to. Um, I mean, what is there really to say? I mean, Brock Bowers had a nice catch and run in this game. Uh, they scored some garbage time points. Defense was flat. I don't know where what's going on with Max Crosby. It might just be because, you know, Malcolm Kuntz gets uh, done for the year here. Tyree Wilson, like, will the real Tyree Wilson please stand up? Or is there a real Tyree Wilson? Like, there's just, there's no edge presence on the other side without Koontz. Um, but, like, where the hell, the, the, the biggest thing for the Raiders was, like, good luck dealing with Christian Wilkins and Max Crosby on that side of the line. Teams haven't had any issues so far. Max Crosby, he's, he's got some sacks, but for the most part, he's 81st in pass rush win rate this year. Like, he's not been Max Crosby. And, and Christian Wilkins, he's had some run stops, but I've barely felt his presence. So the rest of the defense is obviously struggling if that's going to be the case. And then the offense has just been as inconsistent as you could have possibly imagined. So you got, you know, Antonio Pierce after the game you know, calling out players, not individually, but saying, oh, there were some players out there making business decisions, so we're going to have to make some business decisions on our end, too. 
I get you're like, you're the tough dude and all that. But hey, Antonio Pierce, was it, was it, was it a business decision when you um, hunted the game away in the first week of the season? Mr. Tough Guy? You, you can't tell me that he hasn't lost the locker room. I just, I, I don't know if, um, if Patrick Graham wants this job. But if he does, I would, I would nip this in the butt before it gets bad. And I'm not in there. I could just be completely speculating here and things are actually quite good in that locker room, but it does not feel that way. Devontae looks pissed. Um, I think that punt decision just got this whole thing off to such a sour note. And now you got coach pointing fingers and it's just not a good look. All right. We got a few more games left. We got uh, Cleveland versus the New York Giants. Uh, Giants. Hey, man. 21-15, New York Giants. They get their first win of the year. I love it, man. I, I, I feel like everybody that watched the offseason Hard Knocks series at least grew somewhat of a connection to these guys. And, like, Dable just... Not only do I like Dable as a coach, but... He just seems like such a likable football guy. Uh, I want him to succeed. I want this to work for him in New York. And it really hasn't been all bad the last couple of weeks. It has. They lost a close game against the Commanders. Um, but this is a good win. Cleveland's not an easy win, despite all the Deshaun Watson stuff. That's a very challenging defense that they went head-to-head with and made it work, even though Daniel Jones is... is um, just so bland, but Malik Neighbors is insane. And I just, again, back to the hard knocks thing. I love the Dables like, all right, Malik, I'm taking you. We got the same mentality. Your red flag is that if you're not involved, you're going to check out and you're going to be, you know, a guy that complains about getting his targets on the sideline. Me, Brian Dable, that's not a red flag for me. I'm the guy responsible for getting you the ball. I'm going to draft you and we're going to, we're going to, frankly, abuse you with how much we're going to use you. And that's what's happening. They are just funneling the offense through him, and rightfully so. He's so dynamic. And now they're to the point where they're like starting to set plays up. So I love how they got his two touchdowns in this game. You run the fade touchdown uh, early in the game. Beautiful, high-pointed catch for Malik Neighbors. So you put the fear of the fade um, and it's not just like a lining up, running a fade. It's an actual route where he's lined up towards the slot and breaks out. And then the second touchdown, line him up in the slot, fake the, fake the corner, really more of a corner route than a fade, but you fake the corner and then cut inside for a wide open touchdown on the slant. And all Daniel Jones has to do is just stare at him, throw him the football, right? So I, I just love how they're using him. And then also they get a big completion. They're just like, hey, Daniel, Malik's down there somewhere. He gets a huge catch down the sideline in a tough situation. And he would have had another touchdown in this game too, Malik Neighbors, uh, on a slot fade, which was his, that was his money in the NFL where those slot fades. I, I don't remember a receiver that is harder to cover on a slot fade than Malik Neighbors. And uh, they line him up in the slot. They get cover three. They get the perfect look. He's wide ass open and Daniel Jones misses him. It's like, ah, excuse me. That probably wasn't very flattering, but we're going to roll with it. Um, yeah, just, just misses him. It's like, come on, Daniel. Come on. There's a third touchdown. They end up winning the game anyway, but didn't have to be that close if he just hits it. And the funny thing is the very next play, they do the same thing. They're like, we're not going to overcomplicate this. Malik Neighbors is really good at slot fades. It just worked. Cleveland loves to stay in cover three. We're just going to come out, run another slot fade. Um, fortunately, the player was more ready for it this time. He covered him up, but I think Daniel Jones threw it anyway. It was incomplete. Just you love to see that. And then the defense for the Giants was more of what was advertised. They were much better against the run this week. Kind of called out Shane Bowen. He was brought in to stop the run. He hadn't done that the first couple weeks. This week, much, much better. And this D-line 
was as advertised. Uh, Brian Burns, dominant. Uh, Elijah Chapman, undrafted pickup out of SMU. One of these kind of weird athletic tweeners. He's six foot, 278 pounds. It was just kind of this athletic ball of leverage that they're using. Uh, they blitzed 24 times in this game, which was just short of how many times Brian Flores blitzed in Minnesota. And uh, so you've, you've got Bobby Okereke and Micah McFadden showing up as rushers. And then, of course, Dexter Lawrence. I mean, how much credit can you give the guy who gets all the credit here? But he's just so insane. Like, you kind of got to keep bringing it up because I don't think everybody's watching the Giants. Like, I don't think people quite realize how unbelievable he is. He was dominant in this game. Seven pressures, two sacks. Um, but maybe even more impressive what were back-to-back plays late in this game Four minutes left. The Giants are up a touchdown. Um, or maybe not even a touchdown, but, but they're up. And back-to-back plays. It's third and one. So they go QB sneak on third and one. And Lawrence drives the center into Jameis Winston, who's in for the QB sneak. Because God forbid Deshaun Watson gets hurt. That would just be horrible. I can't say that. Can I say that? I don't know. We'll roll. We'll roll. We'll roll through this segment here. But Dexter Lawrence just shoves the center into the quarterback, stops a QB sneak, essentially single-handedly. And then on the next play, Watson's back in. And Watson starts scrambling on fourth and one. Again, four minutes left in this game. He steps up. There's a clear lane. All he needs is a yard, right? There's a clear lane. Uh, the, The edge rushers went wide. He steps up. And then on a pulse, uh, Dexter Lawrence sheds, gets over, brings down Watson, who's lunging for the yard, and he's able to reel him in just ever so short of the first down. So it's not a sack, not a TFL, it's just a tackle. But it was probably the most impressive play Lawrence made because he was, he was getting actively blocked when Watson decided to scramble and only needed a yard, and he's able to disengage and get down the quarterback. Um, for a huge defensive stop. So he was huge. As for Cleveland, I I will continue to pile on Deshaun Watson. He is so bad. He, again, just looks unprepared to me. He's holding the ball way too long. He's inviting pressure. No, the offensive line is not playing great. Some Cleveland fans have been like, it's not all Watson's fault. No, it's not all Watson's fault. DeWan Jones had a rough day. Um, they've had some plays that are just Watson doesn't have a chance because the line is so bad. But for the most part, this is very similar to like what Fields issues were in Chicago. Ball's not coming out. They're blitzing him now. He's not getting rid of the ball against the blitz. He's holding it thinking, what? He's going to get out of a six-man rush in his face? Like, no. Like, the offensive line looks worse, Browns fans, because Watson is not managing the rush. The ball has to come out, and, and he, he doesn't, it's almost like he doesn't know his, his outlets. He doesn't know maybe what everybody's running on every given play even. Like, it, it just is not working. I continue to say the point. He, he feels like the quarterback that they picked up off the street who's played before but doesn't know the playbook. That's what he feels like. And it, that can't be happening. You had all offseason to learn this new offense. So they're spiraling. Um, I, I want to see them make a running back change too. I just, I get that Jerome Ford is explosive and he has some nice plays now and again, but his down to down consistency is so bad. He's, he's non committal, he misses holes. What the hell is wrong with Pierre Strong? I, I don't understand. I feel like Pierre Strong's pretty good, but the Patriots didn't want him. The Browns didn't want him, but when, when he gets used, he produces. So I would love to see a running back change in Cleveland. Jerome Ford just doesn't do it for me. Browns are in trouble. They had to beat the Giants, man. Tough division, tough schedule. They are in a lot of trouble. Okay, we got uh, Detroit versus Arizona is our next game here. 
And I actually have less to say on this game, even though I, I very much enjoy both these teams. I have less to say because this kind of played out exactly as I expected for Detroit and feared for Arizona, where you can't draw up really a worse matchup for Arizona in the trenches. They really are brutal, Arizona, um, O-line, D-line. And that's kind of Detroit's thing, honestly, especially with the O-line. But, um, you know, Detroit comes out 43 carries in this game, 188 yards, 37 minutes to 23 minutes time of possession. Not really a pass rush from the Cardinals. Uh, Jared Goff was, was pretty good outside of one really ugly mistake where they dropped the edge rusher into coverage. Um, and Goff, Goff makes a bad read off of it. Um, Aiden Hutchinson dominant again. Eight pressures and a sack. Kind of an expected day for Detroit. Wasn't, it didn't need to be overly dynamic or overly explosive. Maybe it could have been, but they just came out and kind of kicked the the Cardinals in the teeth and it's just not a, a team especially that the Cardinals can match up with and in a game where the Detroit just lost like I do not want Detroit after a loss like they prove yet again the whole kneecap fighting mentality like remember last year when the whole like um ineligible receiver thing happened I don't remember who they played the next week but I think they won the next game like 48 to 10 I could be wrong about that, but this team, that whole kneecap biting thing is very real, and I don't want this team after a loss. So it, it was going to be a tough day for the Cardinals, but on their side of things, I think they played very frisky defensively. There's only so much they could do with the talent they have, but they hung around. And then offensively, it, it, it is just tough when your time of possession is so lopsided, kind of similar to like the week one Jets. Um, but I, I, as much as I love and pump up Kyler and I will continue to do that, I will say there's a couple throws he, he would want back in this game that if he does otherwise, they actually maybe even have a chance to win this game. Um, but he gets kind of impatient and he throws a really just dumb pick. Like he hasn't really been making these this year, but, um, you know, they're running dig. <laughs> uh, dagger concept Marvin Harrison from the slot running a clear out route and uh, I don't remember who the outside receiver was probably, probably Michael Wilson is running a deep dig and it's, it's perfectly covered and Kyler wasn't necessarily under pressure but he just kind of chucks the clear out to Marvin in a double coverage just stupid throw so I'll, I'll knock him for that and then he had another uh, third down, third and eight in this game. And Marvin gets open on the out route, and Kyler sails it over his head. So there was a couple throws in this game. I don't think Kyler was horrible, but definitely not, definitely not the, uh, the MVP great Kyler that we saw last week. He was just kind of, kind of meh in this game. But that's really all I have. The, the other thing for the Cardinals, too, it comes back to the matchup thing, but they're, that threat of the play action and the run game has been such a big part of this offense too. Like Kyler and Marv have been explosive and fun, but I, I think you, you can, it's easy to lose sight of how good this run game is. And Detroit's run defense, it, it's, it, it's, I feel like I've said this a lot, but it's real. It's, they are an elite run defense and they went up against an elite run game or at least a very good run game and shut it down for the most part. So, not a, not a matchup that favors Arizona for sure. And that played out. Uh, I picked Detroit to cover the spread on the Patreon picks this week for that reason. And it, it definitely played out that way. Two games remaining here. Let's talk about the injury bowl. Niners Rams. Just a resilient win in this one from the Rams. They end up squeezing it out. 27, 24 and it, it, on a day where they were pretty severely outplayed for the first three quarters. And the Niners actually out uh, produced the Rams yardage wise, 425 yards to 295, but key drops and a missed field goal, a big punt return late, just mistakes by the Niners that the Rams weren't making. And 
I just I look at this as a win for the Rams where they dug deep as a team and found a way to win. Uh on a day where like they just they just don't have the weaponry right now, really on either side of the ball. Um, but I, I like how Stafford took care of the football here, kept them around. Iron Williams had a gritty performance, and the defense did just enough. Just enough. It wasn't some dominant day for the defense, but um, I do think the D line stood out in this one against the Niners O line. Both edge rushers. I, th- I think Byron Young had the best gay, uh, best day he's had as a Ram. He impressed me. He he beat Colton McKivitz on a cross chop, gets a strip sack in this game. Um, another mistake by 49ers to, to lose the turnover battle there. Um, but yeah, gets a big win. He has three other pressures doing his thing he, he stood out to me uh, from a run defense perspective his sideline to sideline speed was huge uh, against all the speed that the, that the Niners are trying to break out so he stood out Jared Verse continues to just be a really high floor solid rookie he's not like the game wrecker superstar at this point but an impactful starting edge as you could have hoped um, and then hey Braden Fisk I uh, got a lot of people tagging me you know waiting for my Braden Fisk apology letter. Uh, I think I've shown that I will do that when I think it's appropriate. I'm not quite ready to do that on Fisk. Um, You know, I went in, I watched all of his pressures. We can do that now on NFL Pro, which is just such a luxury. And uh, he had had a nice game. I'll give it to him. He he had a nice game against Dominique Puny. Um, A couple of the the pressures were on stunts. That's going to happen. But the swim moves, the quickness, it was there. He was beating... A rookie, Dominique Puny, uh, three times in this game on good pass rush moves. I'll give him credit for it. Quiet first couple of weeks and um, struggled against the run. So, you know, I still don't see a power profile. Is this a guy that's going to be able to beat like real starting caliber guards? You know, we probably crowned Puny a little bit too quick. Um, but um, he had a nice game. Certainly a step towards me being wrong on him, but no, I'm not going to come out and say I was wrong about Braden Fisk. Not yet, at least, but I will acknowledge he had a good game alongside comrades here who, who gave it their all in this one to keep things close. Um, but again, I don't think this was like an overwhelming day for the defense. They, they were giving up some drives. It was just drops by the Niners, field goal, a missed field goal. Um, and then of course the big play, the strip sack fumble was huge, but yeah, they hung around, got the resilient win. Still, I still don't feel great about the Rams, but it keeps their season alive. You know, they're going to have to find one or two more of these because they're, they're still pretty beat up. But, you know, the hope is they can get guys back healthy and uh, be more of a better roster than, than where they're at right now. But uh, credit where credit's due. I mean, the culture, the coaching... Um, the quarterbacking, the special teams all helped them pull through. As for the Niners, there's an aspect of this team that I'm very worried about, and it really has very little to do with this game, and that is the injury to Javon Hargrave. This D-line is just, it's a, it's a long ways away from what it was a couple years ago, right? Where you had Samson Abouk, well, obviously Nick Bosa, but you had, um, you had Armstead, um, I mean, there was a little bit of a crossover there, but at a point in time, you had DeForest Buckner in there, and then last year you had Armstead and Hargrave on the interior with like Chase Young on the other side. But the point I'm getting at is, for a long time, it's been the case where they have more than just Nick Bosa. They've always had another guy that can beat you one-on-one, if not more than one other guy. And even last year, the D-line didn't feel quite the same, but it, it can't just be Nick Bosa. And right now, I mean, Leonard Floyd's fine. He's a good speed threat. He's a good stunt man. Malik Collins is fine. But this is a long way around, away from that 49ers D-line that you had grown to be like genuinely scared of. And then the coaching just, man... Doesn't, it doesn't feel the same there either. They, this defense does not play as fast as they did under D'Amico um, or Sala. And they've been struggling to find the right guy there. And 
right now, Brandon Staley and Nick Sorensen don't feel like the answer. So I am worried about the defense being pretty like average to maybe even below average. We'll see. I, th- I think that Hargrave injury is is a is not the spot they wanted to get it, get a long term injury at, and he he might miss the whole season. If they're lucky, they'll get him back for the playoffs. But you know, offensively, I'm I'm really not worried. In fact, I'm actually optimistic about their offense long term because. Purdy was actually special in this game. Purdy continues to impress me. Two out of two out of three games, I think he's been elite. And uh, you know, week two, I think he was okay. Um, he wasn't great in that Vikings game. Made some mistakes, but <laughs> he got let down in this game, man. Uh, they got it. I mean, I would cut Ronnie Bell after this performance. I don't think he's shown enough. Before this, and he lost them this game, frankly, Ronnie Bell. Two just brutal drops. If he catches either of them, they probably win. They probably walk away winning this game by three or whatever. And then Brandon Ayuk, he's got to step up, man. He looks like he's sluggish and not winning tough catches, not getting open deep. This was the Brock Purdy, Jawan Jennings show. Um, Really impressed by all the plays Purdy made, the throws he made. And Brandon State, uh, Brand- <laughs> I'm just reading my notes. Getting, getting uh, lengthy in the podcast here, but um, Juwan Jennings. Oh, God, he's so awesome, man. You have 12 catches for like 200 yards, mossing dudes down the field, making tough catches over the middle, just so reliable. He did have another drop as well, but, I mean, that's nothing compared to what he did. But, I, I mean, the thought of, all right, have they unlocked an explosive version of Juwan Jennings? And very quickly, they're going to get Debo and Kittle back. You know, McCaffrey, I mean, he's out in Germany, like, getting his foot looked at right now. That's starting to look kind of suspect. Um, But we'll see. We'll kind of see how that goes. But, uh, I mean, we know this offense can be absolute destroyers. When, when they get all these guys back. so And, and they did. They, they were missing the easy buttons from Debo, the run blocking from Kittle, the, the big clutch plays from Kittle that they seem to get when they need it the most. So it, it's not a great loss. I don't think those were actually the 49ers. Like, it didn't feel like the 49ers that were playing out there. But um, tough to navigate a, an injury-riddled season like this. It really is. Um, Last game here, Dolphins, Seahawks. Save this one for last because it's so hard to take much away from a game where not only is Miami's quarterback situation as disastrous as you could have predicted based on how bad it's been when Tua's been out in the past, that all came through. But there was also 22 penalties in this game, 11 on both sides. It was just like, Constant flags, horrible quarterback play. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a lot to say on this one. Sorry. Um, you know, Miami fans, I don't even know if you're listening this late in a podcast. Um, you know, you either care about the rest of this stuff or you skipped right to this, in which case, sorry, I just don't have much for you. My one note is, I, I will reiterate the point I've made multiple times at this point, where Tua is the system. You can't just... Put anybody in there you can't put most guys in there his ability to throw the ball quick to throw with anticipation is critical for the explosive plays that they get and it's critical to allow this team to play with a bad offensive line because his he gets that ball out before anybody can beat his offensive lineman so it, it comes back to like why they paid to a why they had to pay to a my main concerns on the paying to a thing was always injuries and i'll just leave it there Uh, But I was a little disappointed in Mike McDaniel's ability to find ways to get Hill and Waddle involved in this game. I'm curious to see if he gets a little better at that after revisiting revisiting this. Like at least, number one, like at least try them deep. Neither of these guys got a deep target at all. Like Tim Boyle can throw the ball 40 yards. Like at least try to get a one-on-one and push it. They didn't even try it. It was just a very lousy, conservative game plan. A lot of screens, play action boots, 
outside zone. You would think McDaniel would get even more creative with a backup quarterback. He de- it definitely felt like he got less creative and just tried to let the defense win the game. And for a while, to be fair, uh, the defense did play hard and keep them in this game. But I'm curious to see if McDaniel kind of goes back to the drawing board to try and find creative ways to use his best players. Because Hill and Waddle were just non-factors in this game. Um, as for Seattle, I mean, just hard to give them too much credit here. The, you know, the highlight of this game was Geno hitting DK Metcalf from a clean pocket. The double move against cover two, just a beautiful play, beautiful ball. DK, I mean, there's just few things are more aesthetically pleasing than DK reeling in a deep ball and then outrunning defensive backs. Like he just runs like a deer, man. It's, it's so impressive. And there's a reminder of like, what could be if they could just buy time for Gino? Cause he really is one of the best deep ball throwers in the, in the game. Uh, and DK theoretically should be even more menacing in that regard. He's had a good year so far, but, um, you know, the, the offensive line was not good in this game for Seattle. Their guard play is really a problem. I think they got to make a change at right guard. Just see, see what our guy, um, from UConn, um, what's his name? We're, we're too far removed from draft season, man. He was one of my, my guys in the draft. Uh, oh, I got it. I, I don't need to look it up. Christian Haynes, at least see what he can do. I mean, Anthony Bradford's been a turnstile. So that's been bad. And, and Lincoln Tomlinson's been a problem at left guard. So, you know, Gino didn't have a ton of time to throw in this game. The, the offense was inconsistent because of that. And, uh, you know, Zach Charbonnet ran hard. They did enough offensively because they had the ball all game. Uh, the Seahawks defense played well against horrendous quarterback play um uh Paul or yeah Derek Hall had a great game six pressures and a sack it's just yep took care of business against a team that I think is currently the worst team in football as they're currently assembled so that's all I got that's gonna do it there is your week three recap show I hope you guys enjoyed um if you if you could take just a second to leave a five star review. I think we're nearing a thousand reviews on Spotify. That would just be a really cool landmark if you guys have a second. If you're listening to this at the airport or you know on the exercise bike, whatever it might be, if you could just take a second wherever you're listening to your podcast to leave a review or just drop a like if you're watching this on YouTube. But I appreciate you guys for following the week- weekly recaps and the fully inflated football podcast. We'll see you guys soon. I should be having an interview discussion with uh, our friend Matthew Collar here within a couple days here. So uh, previewing the Vikings-Packers game and reflecting on what we've seen in the NFL so far this year. But that's going to do it. We're out of here. Peace out.